Okay, hello and welcome to the live stream for August 22nd, 2018. I am your host, Dana Morningstar, and this is a live stream that we do every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you are new here, welcome. And if you are returning here, welcome. James, Susan, Deborah, Healthy Love, welcome, welcome. D. Mel, Leslie. Dora, Jennifer, welcome. So Sam, hi, welcome. Kamami from France, welcome. So before I forget, uh, tomorrow is book club. So at 6.30 p.m., it's the last Thursday of every month, we discuss a book. And this month, let me get back to Amazon so I make sure to say the title correctly. We are going to be discussing DBT Made Simple, a step-by-step -step guide to dialectical behavioral therapy. And it's by Sherry Van Digic. That is not how you say her last name. I guarantee you that. But hopefully it's close enough that you can find the book that we're discussing. So... Um, Yes, we'll be discussing that. And then also I wanted to just let you guys know something kind of fun that Angie and I are going to be doing. We're going to be alternating, discussing this um, on her channel and my channel on our Tuesday live streams, which happen at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or either at her channel or, or at my channel. We alternate. But we're going to do kind of this group project of creating a vision board. Um. Hold on a second. Oh my goodness, I'm wrong. Book club is next Thursday. Oh, thank goodness. Because <laughs> I had so much to do tomorrow. Thank you. Um, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Book club, last Thursday of the month, which is August 30th, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, DBT Made Simple. Sorry about that. Sorry for the confusion. Okay, so what Angie and I do, what Angie and I are doing, we're alternating channels. We're going to be talking about going through the process of creating a vision board. And this was something that we were talking about yesterday in our live stream about the importance of creating a compelling future. And so many people after abuse, they get so overwhelmed and uh, I think overwhelmed with healing, where to even begin, how to pick up the pieces how to move forward, what does moving, moving forward even look like, how do we even go about rebuilding our lives, all of these things can be just tremendous, tremendously overwhelming. So we're going to be discussing that. And so the homework assignment that we came up with was for everybody, ourselves included, to find three things for next Tuesday. Or we can also discuss it here on Wednesday if you guys can't make it to the Tuesday streams. So pick three. It can be anything. There's no wrong way to do this. Pictures, words, images, colors, anything that represents kind of what you would like to bring in to this next chapter in your life. And I was sharing yesterday, one of the, I heard the coolest thing a while back about, live, or about um, vision boards and the gal had said that with vision boards, it's not so much about the stuff. So for example, a lot of people with vision boards, they will put up things that kind of they think that they should want or even things that they do want. So let's say if they, they want a brand new Mercedes or they wanna have a trip to Paris or they, if you're me or like me, you really would love to live on a lake, um, something like that. It's not the stuff. So this, this gal's aha moment was, it's not the stuff that drives us. It's what we think those things will make us feel. That's the pull is what we're, what we're really wanting is what, how we think those things will make us feel. So it might not necessarily be the trip to Paris. It might be that sense of adventure, trying something new, going to new places, seeing new things. Uh, for me, a lake house represents a sense of calm, it, um, a sense of community, uh, a sense of fun. It's fun to go out and 
play on the water and to have friends over for a bonfire and to just hang out and be out on the lake. So whatever you think those things, it's go a level deeper, I guess is what I'm saying. And to, to really dig into, okay, emotionally, what would I like this next chapter of my life to have? So, okay. Um, okay, it's a good feedback. Abuse Free says, hi, Dana. I would like to join your book club live, at least for some of the books. I know it's not the best request, but I'm putting it out there. I am in IST time zone. And 6.30 p.m. is 4 a.m. for me. I'm finding it difficult. You know, I've had quite a few people mention that it would be better for us to have live streams at kind of varying times for people that are international. So I'm open to, I'm open to figuring something like that out. So maybe comment down below after this video goes like renders and actually goes live on YouTube, which will be probably three hours or so after um, this airs comment down in the comment section and let's, or I'll st actually, I'll start, I'll start the comment after the video airs and then we can try to figure out, okay, what would maybe be some other good times for people to participate in this chat. Okay. Let me scroll up here and Oh, before I forget, so many things. We were going to start off <laughs> every live stream with something. We're talking about the positive and about kind of spending the first, at least the first half hour or some or so on something positive. So I figured tonight we could talk a little bit more about self-care and... I had some good, I had a friend of mine send me some, some great tips about self-care, which I thought were worth sharing. So she said that for her, self-care is about focusing your attention on what you need emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically, and financially. That self-care can be done in small practices every single day. And it's, it truly is a practice. It's something that gets easier with time. And I think at first, this was, again, something Angie and I were talking about yesterday. When we're not used to self-care, it feels it feels awkward. It's like we have to make time for it because it's something new. And it's just really allowing ourselves to get into that routine of developing a new lifestyle is really what it is. And it, it just it takes a little bit. It's sort of like getting in the habit of going to the gym or you know, reading every day or, or doing anything like that. It's just, it takes practice. So uh, she had said what some of the stuff that she does is was putting post-it notes all over the house with a question, like, did you drink water or how are you feeling right now? And it's her way of reminding herself to do a quick checkup on where she's at and what she needs. I think that is a fantastic idea. Uh, some self-care practices require very little to no planning. Some are more established thought through choices or commitments. And she says, think about things you need to do anyway and how you can make them special. Everybody needs a bath, a shower, uh, taking care of yourself like this. Um, you know, you don't have to have, you can, but you can add to your bath or your shower. You can do a face mask or you can do a little mini pedicure uh, little pampering type things. I even found that doing kind of splur <laughs> splurging, like spending an extra $2 or so on body wash or on, you know, body spray or something like that, that just smells good. That makes me just kind of boost my mood can make a big difference. As she says, turning everyday tasks into mindfulness and an intentional thinking practice Cleaning your house can be your Zen moment of the day. This is true. And I, this is one of my favorite ones. She says, while washing dishes, visualize washing your anger or sadness away. I love that. I think the same thing can be said for like washing our face or washing our hands. One of the, the little mini meditations that I used to do back 
when I was fresh out of this was washing my hands and feeling, allowing myself to just be fully immersed in that moment and feeling the water on my skin, the temperature of the water, the soap on my skin between my fingers, just feeling it lather up, like just being fully present in that moment of washing my hands. It's amazing. And that's something that you can do if you're at work or at home or at the airport, like no matter where you are, just taking 30 seconds to just really get grounded in yourself makes a huge difference. Um, Developing some healthy habits. Self-care is a lot about developing healthy routines. It's good to have some things that you do at the same time every day. For example, taking your vitamins, writing in your journal, exercising, meditating, going for a walk. I agree. I think it's it's a lot easier to develop a new habit when we can link it to something that we're already doing. So for example, if you tend to, let's say if you, you work and you have, you go to lunch at the same time every day, that's already part of your established routine. So it's not too much more effort to, to tell yourself, okay, I'm going to go for a five minute walk, maybe just a walk around the parking lot. Maybe it's just a walk around the building. Maybe it's up and down the stairs five times and being fully mindful of just every single step, kind of doing a walking meditation for those five minutes. And I think the big key to self-care is training ourselves that this is, this is a get to, not a got to. So this isn't adding one more thing to your to-do list. This isn't running through it. It's, this is your time. It's carving out time just for you throughout your day because you matter and your health matters. And it's time that we really make ourselves a priority. And self-care can be anything. It can cost money or it can be free. Puzzles like Sudoku, crossword puzzles, reading a book, playing an instrument, doodling, drawing, creating a vision board, reading a magazine, uh, watching a YouTube video, staring at the stars, coloring in a coloring book, uh, painting, going to one of those painting events with friends, going to a meetup group. You guys know I'm huge on meetup groups. Yes. And she says, stop the to-do list and dance it out. When you feel overwhelmed, interrupt it with something joyful and fun. And that's so true. Sometimes just putting on, if you have a playlist of music that you find empowering or inspiring or relaxing or what have you, uh, making that a part of your self-care for the day. So what do you guys normally do for self-care? Yes, I agree. Kiara says self-care should also be implemented every day in small ways. We should build it into our day as a small addition, as opposed to trying to reserve hours a day for it. Yes, absolutely. And I think so many people, myself included, when we think of self-care, we think of it has to be this, we've got to go schedule a massage or schedule a pedicure or kind of these expensive time consuming things. And if you don't have a lot of time or if you don't have any extra spending money, then it can sort of feel like, well, I'll just sometime down the road, sometime when I'll do those things, but not, not this month. Like I just don't have the time or the money this month to do it. But then so it's sort of like someday never comes and, or we get to the point where our bodies just start breaking down because we're not taking care of ourselves and we're forced to take time off work or to go to the chiropractor or to get a massage or to go to the doctor or what have you. Benjamin says for self-care, he plays his bass guitar or rides his long scape or his longboard. Yeah, very cool. And I think too, it's knowing what is self-care for you. Sam is saying that he grooms his beard and every other week he totally shaves it. He says, he says it grows so fast. My goodness, it must. If you can, you have enough of a beard to groom every week. That's, that's wild. He says, then I take a nice walk very early on in the mornings. Yeah, so if that's something that's relaxing to you, you know, taking a long walk or just taking 
I could see how that could actually be kind of a Zen thing. It's sort of like those little, um, you know, sandbox things with the little rakes, <laughs> like you're raking it, except, but it's your face. Like you're just grooming your face. Like it's one of those little Zen sandbox things. You know, you're really there and present in the moment. When I first started getting into self-care, I really struggled with, I thought I should, same with vision boards. I had this list of things that I thought I should be doing, like taking long bubble baths. I don't really, I'm not a bath person. I don't really enjoy it. I get really just kind of antsy and bored quickly. So baths are not relaxing for me. And so I always put it off, put off doing it because I didn't enjoy it. You know, but I thought, well, I should enjoy it because that's what people do. <laughs> people that take care of themselves, like they take baths or, um, oh, I'm trying to think of so many other things that I used to do that I thought I should. Oh, spending money on clothes. I'm not a big clothes person. And so it actually, I realized it stressed me out to spend money on clothes or nice buying nice journals. I used to think people would say, oh, you know, they, I had a friend, I've had a couple of friends that really spend a lot of money and buy like a quality journal. You know, it's like leather bound and it's, you know, like embossed and it's just this really, you know, 30 or $40 journal. And I found when I had done that, I, I bought this really cool handmade like felt and sequenced journal. And it had, the paper was beautiful. It was pressed, it was homemade pressed paper and it had rose petals in it. It was gorgeous. But then I found that I didn't want to write in it because I wanted to make sure that what I was writing was like worthy of this paper <laughs> and this book. And so I just didn't really write a whole lot in there. So it's just kind of knowing yourself and like what does, you know, what's relaxing to you, what's self-care. Like my big thing for self-care lately has been, I totally switch gears and I watch either Cinema Sins, which is one of my favorite YouTube channels, or uh, any Game of Thrones discussion channel, because I love that show. And it's just so different from reality. Oh, that's a good idea. New Life, New Hope says, I listen to audiobooks in the bath, and then I can relax without getting bored. That's, that's a good idea. Okay, Kim brings up a great point. She says, Dana, I won't lie. I self-medicate with alcohol. I do it to numb myself. I am by no means an alcoholic, but I find it helps me. Any tips on how to help me walk away from this self-medicating behavior? So I think a lot of people struggle with that and they, it's easy and understandable, I think, to gravitate towards things that kind of help us numb out, whether it be some people use alcohol, some people use illegal drugs, some people use prescription drugs. Um, when I was in, I was married to a man in the military and uh, I was shocked at the number of people military, active military that were abusing prescription drugs because, you know, you obviously can't do illegal drugs when you're in the military because you might get kicked out. So prescription drug use was a huge, huge issue. I just wish I had no idea. And that was their way of dealing with stress because a lot of, uh, they didn't want to see a therapist. They didn't want anything to be on their record. So a lot of people kind of numb out in a wide variety of more like socially acceptable ways like that. Um, if you're aware or if you're starting to feel like, you know what, I don't think this is a healthy way of coping. That's one thing to have maybe a glass of wine every now and again. But if if it's one of those things of, boy, where, where that stuff can become a slippery slope if we're like, man, I've had a bad day. I need alcohol to make me feel better. Or I need food to make me feel better. Or I need to spend money in order to make me feel better. That's when it can, can become a problem. So uh, I think with, with stopping any type of behavior that is negatively impacting us, whatever it might be, I think it's always easier 
to, to kind of crowd it out and to, so to take the focus off of like stopping drinking and shifting it to building up healthier coping strategies. So like, because the universe hates a void, you know, and when we stop something, it's like stopping anything, stopping smoking or anything else, then you're just sitting there. And then what are you doing? Like you're focusing on, okay, I can't drink. I can't drink. I can't smoke. You know, like you're, you're fixated on what you can't do. And if you if you haven't filled that void with anything that you can do, then the thing that you're missing just is screaming at you even more because if you're trying to get that need met, if that, if the, if the need that the alcohol is meeting is getting rid of anxiety. And if that's kind of your main way of getting rid of anxiety, that anxiety still needs to be reduced somehow. So it can be a lot more helpful to think about, okay, how can I better cope with this anxiety? And then to really focus your energy on that. So maybe going to more meetup groups, maybe, uh, exercising, maybe going for a walk, maybe um, doing some adult coloring books, maybe um, taking a bath, uh, yoga, um, you know, calling a friend. If you're seeing a therapist or if you're in a support group, maybe doing more of that, reading. And maybe it might be all of these things. So sometimes... If, especially if we have a way of coping that's, it's easy, right? Like it's easy to crack open a beer or to pour ourselves a glass of wine. It can be a lot more involved if we're like going to a yoga class or calling a friend. Um, actually calling a friend is a lot easier than going to a yoga class. But it, so it can help to have kind of an idea of like a range of things that we could do in case we're like, man, it's pouring out, pouring rain. I don't really want to go to this yoga class. Like what else could I do? you know, calling a friend or taking up cooking or getting, you know, organizing something, maybe he's watching some different YouTube videos, those kinds of things. That is so awesome. Slavic princess says, Dana, speaking of self-care after, uh, she says, I have been doing intensive inner child work. I am slowly learning to feel comfortable with honest communication 100%, 110% of the time. Yeah, that is very cool. Isn't it? I, I'm still not there at 100. I'm not definitely not at 110. I'm probably at about, I don't know, 85, 90, maybe. There's still def definitely times that uh, it's, I'm not, there's still certain people in certain situations that I need to work on, but I'm getting there. Isn't it so awesome when you start getting more in alignment where you're like, yeah, uh, I feel like I'm walking in my truth and I'm saying yes when I mean yes and no when I mean no and I'm bringing up topics in like an assertive way and I'm trying to resolve things and I'm just, I'm feeling good, like feeling really comfortable just asserting myself and being myself. So I'm just so glad that you're doing that. I would love any lessons or aha moments that you have to share, please, please share. Healthy Love says, I have to say, though, I love the new me walking in my truth and caring and loving me. Okay, let's see. Yeah, and New Life says, I tried putting self-care items on my to-do list, but that didn't work as it turned them into chores. Absolutely. That's something that I struggle with too, because I'm such a list maker. And especially if I'm trying to cultivate a new habit, I have to, I struggle with, I feel like I need to put it on a list, but then it, I feel like the stuff that really lasts for me, I might only have to put it on a list for maybe like a week or so. And then like, I only have to push myself for so not a very long time. And then it starts pulling me because it's something that I really want to do. So, but yeah, you definitely want to make self-care. This is a, this is a get to, not a got to. Okay. 
Okay, let's see. Well, that's an interesting question. Dandelion Greens asks, would self-care create self-value or vice versa? I would say in large part, yes, because when, when we value ourselves, we take care of ourselves, you know, and that can feel so uncomfortable especially if a person has, has made themselves, uh, put themselves in the back burner for so long and made everybody else a priority. We can really get out of alignment with treating ourselves with value. It can sort of feel like, you know, again, like someday when my life settles down, when I have money, when I have the time, when the kids leave the house, when, win, win, win someday, right? And then if that doesn't happen, or it's, we're talking years down the road, then and we're still not taking care of ourselves. We're still not, we have, we're not valuing ourselves. And we actually have less to give to those who are relying on us to help take care of them. So uh, I think, the, and though I think the more, it, like I was talking about earlier about crowding, crowding the negative out, the more we get used to feeling good, that's, I think, one of the big keys in all this. Like, the more you get used to feeling good, the less you want to feel bad. I think so many of us have been so out of tune with what it feels like to feel good that feeling bad has just become our new normal. But it doesn't take, but that's not, even though it is our new normal, it, it's not the, the normal for your, like, authentic self. Like, your authentic self knows deep down there's something off, there's something wrong, there's something out of whack here, this is not working for me. And so when you start feeling good, your authentic self is like, oh my goodness, thank you so much. It, it just, it, it knows what it needs and it's been trying to signal to you. So the more you can spend time in that zone of like nourishing yourself, feeling good, a lot of these other unhealthy people or toxic people and, and toxic uh, ways of coping or unhealthy ways of coping, these tend to just kind of naturally fall by the wayside because we're, we just get so used to feeling good. It's sort of like, you know, if, you, if you're going to the gym, uh, you don't crave junk food. You know, it's like your body is just it's craving, you just start building up that momentum where your body's like, man, you're, you're craving fruits and vegetables. You're craving water. Like, no, I don't know of anybody. I'm sure there might be some people out there, but most people you leave the gym and what do you want? Like a big glass of water, right? You don't want like a big milkshake or a big soda. Uh, you want, you know, fresh, clean, cold water. Deborah says, at the age of 31, I am just now taking care of myself. I think a lot of people don't even, and I, frankly, I would say that is young. I think a lot of people start kind of realizing, probably I would say more, more often than not, probably in their 40s and 50s of oh my goodness, things are really out of whack. My life has been really out of whack for quite a while now. And how do I get things back on track? And that's when they start doing this digging of maybe they're, they're seeking out a therapist. They're starting to read self-help books. They're going to self-help seminars. They're trying to kind of figure out how can I make my life better? And then they start kind of, you know, putting the pieces together. Like everything just slowly starts kind of coming into focus. Yeah, Slavic Princess says, yes, it's because your inner child always has your best interest. Yes, inner child, inner self, um, authentic self. That part of us does always have our best interest in mind. And I really, truly believe that we never lose sight of that. It's, uh, it's perhaps less about discovering it and more about uncovering it. Like it's always there. It's always there within you. It's just reconnecting. It's reconnecting with that. And, um, and then also, I mean, I guess once you do start uncovering it, I don't know, maybe, maybe like it just kind of all feeds itself, right? Like you uncover things and then you, then it leads to like more discovery, which leads to more uncovering, which leads to more 
or maybe not discovery, but like creation, like you uncover parts of yourself and then you can start building on that and then creating an even more empowered self. Benjamin says he's 41 now, uh, but turned things around uh, four or five years ago. Yeah. Mothering hand says I'm 56 years of age and only now realize that I matter. Yes. It's such an aha moment. And um, it's such a game changer, you know, once it's sort of like that scene from the wizard of Oz, you know, Dorothy, here she is. She's in, she's in Oz. She's lost. She got picked up by this, you know, this tornado and it carried her to this faraway place. And, and I just, I love that story on so many different levels. And so what does she find, right? She finds these people that basically represent parts of herself. You have, or I guess you could view it metaphorically as parts of herself. You have the, the scarecrow, the tin man and the lion, and so you have courage, you have intelligence, and then you have heart. And it was once she really got into alignment with all of that. And then I guess you could also say Toto is more like intuition or instincts, right? And so once all of those things really began working together, as she's going down this path, she's able to, you know, sometimes she ends up encountering different challenges and the flying monkeys and the wicked witch and all of these things, and she's trying to find her way back home and she's trying to find her way, her way. And finally the, the Glenda, the good witch is like, honey, this it's been inside of you all along. Like you've always had the power. And it's, it's so that, you know, um, it really just starts with turning with it within and rediscovering those parts in yourself of, of what feels nourishing, what feels draining, uh, what makes you uniquely you? Like what juices you? What, it, what is an honest assessment of like your strengths and your weaknesses? We all have them. Um, you know, just what juices you? What doesn't juice you? Are you living a life that you feel is somebody else's wants for you? Like, are you, are you, an engineer because your father wants you to be an engineer or are you an engineer because you're fascinated with engineering? You know, are you getting married to somebody out of obligation or are you keeping friendships in your life just because you've known the people for 30 years and the friendship really died a long time ago. And frankly, you can't stand this person. And, and half the time you kind of wonder if they even like you, you know, like it, what, what in your life needs, some re-evaluating. Okay. Uh, let's see, here's some questions. Yes, absolutely. Andrea says, self-care is challenging for codependence because we spend so much time focused on others. We feel guilty when we do things for ourselves. We have to fight against that. Yeah. It's amazing how difficult that can be and how unnatural feeling it can be to, to actually make our wants and needs a priority. And uh, especially if we've, if we, for those of us, I think that have had a whole lifetime of caring for other people. If you're a teacher or a social worker or a therapist or a nurse or uh, in the caregiving profession of any kind, because you wanted to actually care for people. And then parents fall into this all the time too, where it's like, you just, you give and you give and you give and you give and you give. And there is no thought to like taking time out to kind of refill your own well so that you can comfortably give. Uh, let's see. Kiara, that's a great question, says, hey, Dana, how do you deal with self-deprecating humor? How do we stop ourselves from doing it? Why does it feel good sometimes? 
Well, I think it feels good sometimes because it's a way of just relieving anxiety. It's a way of relieving our anxiety and our frustrations with ourselves. So this is something I slip into as well. And it's something that I'm really, it's one of the things that I am working on. And uh, I was even talking to, or even like little put downs and stuff. I was talking to a friend earlier and I'd made a comment uh, about, oh, I, I don't know. I'd forgot. No, I think I was talking about how I was over overbooking myself and forgetting things or something. And I had called myself a dingbat and <laughs> uh, for doing that. And I just kind of laughed it off. But deep down, I was like, you know what, really, like you need to stop, stop with that. Like use different terminology because, you know, how does that saying go? Something like, be careful of how you talk to yourself because you're listening. And there's so, there's just still so much truth in that. And um, so I think, how do you stop it? I think it's, it's like anything else, awareness that, that there's a problem is always the first step. And then it's just that this ongoing concerted effort to do something different is, is necessary. So it's catching yourself when you find that, um, you know, that you, that you're doing that so you can stop. And it's not going to happen all at once. You know, most, most changes it's going to take, you know, it takes time. It takes, what is it like something like on average, like 30 days or so to develop a habit. Well, if you think about it, okay, if we're, do, if we're talking about uh, not drinking alcohol anymore or going to the gym or uh, kind of not doing any self-deprecating humor, if it's going to take 30 days to build a habit and you figure that kind of stuff, it's pulling at you at least once a day. Sometimes it's more than once a day. So let's say twice a day, okay? Um, that's going to be in 30-day span, that's 60 times. So what more often than not, I think, especially we're so used to living in kind of this like instant gratification culture that we can think, yeah, 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 I tried that. It didn't work. And it's the reality is like, well, how many times did you try that? And I think a lot of us were like, you know, four or five. It's like, okay, try it 44 times <laughs> or 66 times. And then let's talk because that's really about how much it takes of, of doing something. That's, that's repetitive anything else, doing something four or six times and then throwing up our hands and saying, oh, it didn't work. That's not the kind of effort that habit change requires. Like it really does require, you know, 44, 66 times of doing something in a somewhat consistent fashion over a consistent period of time to start training ourselves to do something different. Um, Robin asks, Dana, how can you, how can you connect with the inner child? If the abuse started so early, it's painful to see that inner child. Great question. I think with your inner child, it's less about seeing them and more about feeling them. So it's really getting in tune with your wants, your needs, your thoughts, your feelings, and your intuition, and that kind of stuff, it really does take practice. Um, I say start with, sometimes it's easy easier to start with things you don't like. So if a person's had a whole lifetime of abuse, what they do like might have been so kind of ground out of them. They've not been allowed to have wants or needs or expectations or standards, or they haven't been able to say no or to assert themselves or, or any of that without some sort of like negative repercussion. So it might help to, to start with things that you know you don't like. So if you know for and it, this, you can start with things big or small. So if you know, okay, I absolutely don't like tomatoes. They always give me heartburn. Okay, that might not seem like a huge insight, but it's these little things add up. Okay, so just start with where you are, and then you can start to kind of hone in on things that are more significant to your life. Um, 
knowing what you need. So revisiting kind of the basics, food, clothing, shelter, safety kinds of things. What do you need in order to have these things checked off your list and that kind of, where are you with those things now? Um, feelings, getting in tune with what makes you feel bad, what makes you feel good, what makes you feel nourished, what makes you feel drained, what makes you feel juiced, uh, what makes you, what just turns you off completely. And journaling about this is, can be a really great way to start doing stuff like this. Going through magazines, going through uh, Pinterest can be another way of just looking at other pictures if you're not able to really think of anything and trying to get rid of that inner critic and that judgment of, oh, I don't want to say anything mean about anything, or this isn't about judgment. It's about curiosity. It's just getting curious with yourself and getting to know yourself. Okay. Jennifer says uh, she used to be addicted to Pinterest. Yeah, it is. It is an addictive website. I'll tell you guys a quick story real quick. Um, you know, we had this house fire back in May and we're still in an apartment. They, they're they just now really, they've done all of the demo work. Now they're starting on the rebuilding and it's going to, we just found out yesterday, it's going to be probably another two or three months before we're able to get back in. But we, we had all of this stuff. Pick, we had to pick out every single thing in the house. So all of the cabinets, the paint, the flooring, like the, ca- I mean, the light fixtures, the ceiling fans, we had to get a new furnace. We had to get, I mean, new doors, everything, everything except for the drywall and like three in the bedrooms and in the dining room, in the living room. Everything else we had to pick out. So we were doing such a good job, <laughs> like moving moving full speed ahead with that. And then I made the mistake of going on to Pinterest to get some ideas for, for bathrooms. And that was the beginning of the end. I We ended up changing so much stuff because I just got so inspired off of Pinterest. And uh, yeah, so I we'll see. We'll see how the house ends up looking. <laughs> Yes, Jen, um, up yours, Nark says uh, she was also dis- addicted to Pinterest and the whole thing of how many things can you create in a mason jar? Oh my gosh, yes. my f- I had a friend that was super big into that and wanted to create like the dried soups in a mason jar and salads in a mason jar and uh, like little casseroles in a mason jar and yeah, on and on and on. James asks, um, basically, how do you recognize your authentic true self? I think it's more about how it's more about feeling that you're in alignment with your, with who you are. It's just that feeling of flow of, yeah, man, that my life is working for me. I am doing things that I really enjoy, even if it's work, you know, um, even if, so like, for example, I really, enjoy writing most of the time. I'm not a big fan of editing and I'm, there's things about it that I, that can feel like drudgery, but more often than not, I'm like, man, this is really fun. It's fun to see the process come together. It's fun to see the words come together and the process itself is fun. It can be, it's like learning anything new. It can be frustrating. Like just like learning the guitar or learning how to ice skate or whatever there's parts of it that are frustrating, but you're so enjoying the overall experience that it feels like flow. And it's those kind of flow states, those things that really pull us, that really juice you. That I think is when you know that you're just more in alignment. And then of course, by the results that you're getting in your life, if things are working, if you're really surrounding yourself with people that are empowering and nourishing and 
they're just solid, good people that, you know, like have your best interests in mind and they're supporting you and you're able to do the same thing for them. And so when you guys get together, it's just this awesome sauce kind of time where it's like, they're comfortable sharing their hopes and dreams and fears with you and vice versa. And uh, you guys are all kind of moving in the same direction. Um, It's just, so your friendships are in flow. The time that you're spending is quality time and that's in flow. And it just, more often than not, things are working for you. This doesn't mean that you don't have a bad day. It doesn't mean that certain things that you really enjoy doing don't feel like work sometimes. It's just that more often than not, you're feeling, you're feeling good. Like you're just, you're feeling good. You're like, you feel like your life's on track. Oh, thank you. Challenge me for the live stream donation and says, Continue the fight and education of narcissism and the mental and emotional harm it does. Thank you for your light. You are so welcome. And it is my pleasure to be able to do this. I, it's just so incredibly rewarding. So, so thank you. Okay, let me see here. Okay, some people had asked about how can you heal and get better if you're still in an abusive relationship because they can't leave yet. And here's the thing with that. It's it's going to be an added challenge in many ways, trying to get healthy and to have a nourishing life when you have someone that's so disruptive and toxic as as a part of your inner circle. Because what tends to happen with abusive people, especially with narcissists, is the more, the happier you are, the more in tune, in flow, feeling good, the more it just stirs up the pot within them. And all of this, like these feelings of inadequacy, the envy, the, you know, all of this, this, this unresolved gunk within them just bubbles to their surface. And so I would anticipate that they're there. It's not going to go over well, that they're going to start telling you all of your hob, everything about that you're trying to do is stupid. They're going to try to invalidate all of it. I would just anticipate for that, um, that, you know, you don't have the money for it. You don't have the time for it. You it's stupid. Um, you know, you're, you're never going to succeed at that. Why, why even bother? I would just, prepare yourself for all kinds of garbage. So what you can do with around a person like this is I think to anticipate going in that that's how they're going to respond to whatever it is that you're trying to do to better your own life. And so to be very selective about what you share with them. If, if you've got this toxic person in your life, um, that's maybe, well, I guess parent or spouse, it doesn't matter. Uh, just telling them kind of the bare minimum, realizing that this person's not an emotionally safe person that I can share my victories with. So no, just knowing that, you know, that can really be helpful. And so then also kind of building up your support system, which I, this is something that I encourage people to do if before they're trying to leave, because what a lot of people do is they've made this narcissist their whole world and then they, they're like, man, I've got to get out of this relationship. It's so incredibly toxic and draining. And then they leave and then they have nothing. And they have no friends. They have no support system. They have nobody to come home to. It's, it's scary. It's lonely. It's uh, just very traumatic. It's upsetting. And then they might also still have the abuser who is harassing them. And... So I'm a big fan, like we were talking about earlier, putting in a ton of of the positive, of the nourishing, of the empowering, get that stuff in your bucket. And it can really help, uh, especially if you are thinking about leaving, the more you can kind of get fill your bucket ahead of time before you need it, the easier it's going to be to leave and to stay gone. So Going to, I'm a big fan of going to meetup groups, trying new things, getting out there, meeting new people, uh, 
if you're interested in like therapy or life coaching, um, joining some support groups, these kinds of things, but ideally finding people that are, that you can relate to that and relate to, it can be very validating to find people that can relate to like the abuse part of all this, that they can relate to where you've been. But I think it's really important to find people based on like where you're going. So like this next chapter in your life, if you want that to be about, you know, taking up different positive hobbies or self-development or uh, positive things, relating to people based on positive things. Okay, here's a question from Kiara who says, uh, how do we deal with hypercritical people? How do we navigate them? Well, I think it depends on where these people are in your life. So hold on, my camera just seems up too high. I'm gonna, is that better? I don't know if that's better or not. <laughs> Sorry, I was just noticing, I'm like, I, I don't know, that might be, whatever, that might be weird, uh, whatever. Um, Dealing with hypercritical people. Uh, I just try to steer clear of them as much as, as much as I possibly can. So if they're in your inner circle, if you can start weeding those people out and at least not having them in your inner circle, that would be a really great start. So I guess it, like I said, I guess it just depends on where this, these people are in your inner circle. I try to change the topic. I try to shut down conversations. Like I don't really, I don't need to be criticized. I don't want, I'm totally open to people's feedback, but only certain people's feedback. If I'm feeling bullied by a person, if I feel like their, their comments or their feedback or what have you is not coming from a place of care and compassion. It's coming from a place of like insecurity and just being hateful. Then I, who needs that? Like, that's not helpful. I don't need that. Like I've got people in my life that really, like I freaking love constructive criticism so much. You know, I'm such a huge fan of that, but the people in my life that do give me constructive criticism, like we have, we have that understanding of, they'll, you know, like they're respectful about it. And so I might ask their opinion or they might, ask, they might ask me and say, hey, you know what? I've got some feedback for you. Are you open to hearing it? Like they don't just come at me with like a barrage of like quote unquote brutal honesty, which is really just a, you know, thinly veiled nastiness. Yeah, Healthy Love says, hanging out with critical people just makes me more critical of myself. I'd rather avoid it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Kuntane, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Kuntane, Kuntane mom says, my self-soothing has been listening to you and Richard with headphones on all the time. I don't feel alone and I'm actually making connections with positive people and getting support. Well, I'm glad that we can be there for you. And I'm glad that you're making some connections with positive people and getting support. I think that's so fantastic. And it's going to be a big part of your healing. There, there is a, um, a, a meditation thing that I did let me see. I'll put the link in here. Let me look it up on YouTube real quick. It is. It's a CPTSD healing from complex PTSD meditation that I created about a year ago. And it has affirmations in it. And it's something that people a guided meditation. I think it's a guided meditation. It might just be affirmations. Kootenai. Is that, am I saying that right now? Kootenai. Okay. Good deal. 
Uh, so yeah, so those those meditations are are positive. They're a hundred percent focused on like self esteem and validation and just finding peace and calm in your life. So I am working. I don't know if Paul is here tonight or not, but. Uh, he, Paul and I are working on a series of meditation videos and guided affirmations on like specific topics. So hopefully we'll start getting those out probably by the end of next month. But I, I know people like, I get this a lot. People are like, oh, you know, the live streams really help me. And it's nice that they're three hours long and I can listen to them as I'm going to bed. And it just, it feels uh, comforting with just a voice that I'm familiar with and you know, these kinds of topics, I, I guess I always get a little bit concerned because some, oftentimes these topics can be so heavy that I just, I guess I just get concerned. I just want you guys to have uh, some peace in your life where the focus is not on the narcissist. It's just on you and your healing and um, positivity. So, Okay. That meditation, the, the link that I also posted is also in podcast form. It's episode 130 if, you're, if you subscribe to my podcast, which is also called Thrive After Abuse. So if you are a podcast person, check it out. Let's see. Galactic MC, that's an awesome name, says, how do you make a living when it feels like your close ones are just there to sabotage your success and progress? Like they just combat all of your ideologies and get mad when you call it out. This is the challenge with taking the road less traveled and whatever that road might be. So if you're, especially I think if it's a creative route that other people really don't get. You know, if everybody in your inner circle is like, hey, man, this is what we do. Like, we work a, we work a nine to five job and that's it. Like, you want to get into music or you want to get into acting or YouTube or anything like that. They don't do it, man. People, you know, people don't really make money at stuff like that or you could never support yourself or it's never going to work. There's, there's no shortage of people out there that are going to tell you that you can't do something. And the road less traveled is traveled less for a reason. It's a difficult road. And it's oftentimes full of, it's a hard road. It's full of unpredictability to say the least. And if you're doing, and I'm not sure exactly like what you're wanting to do that other people around you don't support, but if, if you are talking like some sort of creative field with like music or art or acting or any of that kind of stuff, you're talking about, you've really got to get to the point where you've got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I can't say that enough. And so oftentimes that being comfortable with being uncomfortable, you've got to get, you've got to get comfortable with rejection. You've got to get comfortable with the haters. You've got to get comfortable with people just not getting it. And I'll tell you what, to add insult to injury, if you do start making a name for yourself, there's going to be no shortage of people. Those, those same people that told you that you could never do it, that, that's just not reserved for you, they're going to tell you how lucky you are. <laughs> and they're not going to see all of the time. They're not going to appreciate all of the time that you put into it because they just will never understand. And I guess I just would encourage you, don't wait for all the lights to be green don't wait to get validation and support from everybody in your inner circle. You just, if you're, if you're feeling that pull of like, you know what, I don't want to die with regret. Like I really want to give this an honest go, start researching whatever it is. I'm going to see if you answered what it is that you want to do. So I can speak more specifically to your situation. Hip hop music. Okay, man, you are living in the right time. Can I just tell you that the internet is such a game changer, SoundCloud, Spotify, game changers. So yeah, putting out like anybody can put out music, you know, and if you can put out multiple songs on a regular basis and start getting that attention and then listening to feedback, 
that's the thing. In, and it's it's a kind of a hard line to walk, like to screen out who are the haters versus where, you know, do they have like valid feedback or are they just haters? You can, I think if you're somewhat in tune with yourself, you can kind of screen out the difference, but you're going to encounter that in any path that's not the path that other people think that you should choose. So I mean, even like with this YouTube channel, like, you know, it's, it's just an uphill climb. There's people that say all kinds of just nasty, horrible things. And I mean, I've had my channel hacked. I had a funny thing I noticed happen a few months ago. Not only did my channel get hacked and porn was put on it, then somebody else, another hacker <laughs> was in there and they were like trolling the channels that they had subscribed me to. Like, it was just the most bizarre thing. Anyhow, so like, there's all kinds of weird things that you have to, like, that you have to deal with when you go down the path less traveled. I mean, I've had my website hacked multiple times. I've had just this learning curve from hell with technology and with social media. And you figure out what works, what doesn't work. And you have to be willing to put yourself out there and not only just get sand kicked in your face over and over and over again by people, but you have to just risk being embarrassed. And I have all kinds of friends that are far more talented than I am that are better, you know, definitely better graphics designers than I am. They're better with website stuff. They're better with writing. They're better. They're a better speaker. They're, um, would be a far better YouTuber than probably I could ever be, frankly. But you know what? They're not doing this. I am. And I'm passionate enough about this topic and about what I'm doing to keep at it in spite of all of the setbacks, all of the frustration, all of the long hours, all of the, all of it. So I guess what I'm trying to say in a nutshell is there's always going to be people out there that are not going to be supportive of what you do and instead of spending all of this time and energy trying to convince them that what you're doing is valid, you just have to grow stronger dreams. And you just smile and you nod and you change the subject or you distance yourself from them. And, you know, if you're on the right track, you should start seeing results. And if you're not seeing the needle move, you know, I would say with like music and stuff, really getting active in your genre uh, on Instagram, like, you know, getting the word out about your music and talking to other people and like liking their posts and um, creating a Facebook page and all of that. Cause it's not whatever your message is, it's that's only part of it. Another big part of it's, it's actually letting the world know what your message is. So having, being a good hip hop, artist is is awesome but it's getting people to discover that you're a good hip-hop artist jamie well thank you it says dana your passion definitely comes through in these videos thank you well thank you it's um you know it's a big learning curve and it's it can be it's no joke. It's hard. It's hard to fail <laughs> and to ride this learning curve in front of other people. It's, it's embarrassing, you know, when you can't figure out technology or your microphone's not working or you don't know what to say, or you say something that you really are like, man, what a, you know, you're just embarrassed by what you said, these kinds of things it, it happens. And you just got to drive, learn what you can drive on. Oh, that's awesome. Jennifer says, I started a painting earlier today for the first time in months, and I'm working on it some more right now, listening to this. Awesome. Very cool. Blue Moon says, on the road less traveled, you will encounter rocks, boulders, and thorny bushes, but the destination can be beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. And up yours, Nark says, crowding out the cluster bees from your life by getting busy figuring out your best life. 
Yes. And I would say it's, it's just the unsupportive people in general. And, you know, I've, I know I've shared this story before, but like my brother has fibromyalgia. He's also dyslexic and he's had a really, he developed fibromyalgia when he was a senior in high school. Uh, and here was a kid who loved to work out. Like that was his thing. He had pictures of Arnold Schwarzenegger. He had like gym routines all over his bedroom wall when he was a kid. I'm talking like elementary school before like workout routines were really a thing. He was so passionate about fitness, developed fibromyalgia. Like he already has such a hard time in school with being dyslexic and, and ADD, I should add. He was incredibly hyperactive and just really scattered and anyway, and then fibromyalgia when he was a teenager and he really wanted to be a personal trainer, but he kept being told like, no, you need a job that's safe and secure, that has good benefits. And so he was, had worked at Starbucks for like a long time just for the benefits. And he, and he, and my brother's an easygoing guy. Like he liked a lot of what he was doing at Starbucks, but it wasn't his passion. And he finally, the catalyst for him was he was dating this gal, found out that she was cheating on him. It devastated him. And he just thought, well, basically my life sucks anyhow. So I don't even, he just didn't care. He got to the point where he was so depressed. He just didn't care. And so he decided, I'm just going to, if I, I'm going to fail anyhow, if I, I feel like I'm failing anyhow, I might as well fail at doing something I love. And so then he got involved. I started training to be a personal trainer and then took the exam and passed. And now he does that and he's really, really successful with it. So, you know, like it's just, and he didn't tell anybody like I did. I, my brother and I are really, really close. I've always been like one of his number one supporters when it comes to anything. And, uh, I was really kind of shocked and hurt that he didn't tell me about it, but he was that like feeling really vulnerable about it. Cause everybody, I mean, not, not me, but like most other people in his life had been telling well, maybe me I'll have to, I don't remember ever saying anything discouraging, but maybe I did. I'll have to ask him anyways. He had been hearing that from so many different people and, you know, but he had to dig deep and just grow stronger dreams. And now he's, he's, you know, happy about that. He's wanting to get into film and acting. And my brother is a few years younger than me. I'm 41. He is 39, 39 in October, I believe. Yeah. 39 or 40. I'll have to double check. I think he's 39. Um, but you know, 39, 38 now and going into acting. So, you know, there's a lot of things that could be perceived to kind of be against him. You know, he's not starting out when he's eight years old, like so many people do with acting, but he's going for it. And he took some classes in film school and him and his friends have been, you know, really taking it seriously and like practicing all this stuff. And, you know, whether or not it'll go anywhere is anybody's guess, but he's, he's doing the things he needs to do to make it happen. And that's all any of us can do in that kind of direction. Yeah. New life, new hope says I can't imagine having fibromyalgia as a teenager. I've had it for just over 20 years. Oh my goodness. I also have ADD. It's amazing that your brother is making his dreams come true despite the obstacles. Yeah. I mean, I, thank you. I know I'm so proud of him. I mean, he just is such a neat guy and he has such an amazing attitude and his fibromyalgia was really debilitating for probably about a good 10 years. Um, I haven't heard him talk about it too much, but there were times, I mean, there were times he used to walk with a cane and that he looked gray and he had tried all kinds, all kinds of different remedies and going to different doctors and really struggled, really, really struggled.
Okay, let's see. Anna from Stockport, England says, Dana, did you go, did going through two narcissistic relationships make you understand more why women went back to abusive partners um, than I think going into women's refuges, like going into shelters? Yes. So I think my big, I don't know, I had so many takeaways from that with my own experiences. One of the reasons, I think the big reason that I found myself in two very similar relationships in a very short amount of time is I wasn't linking up the correct cause and effect. So what helped, like the big piece of the puzzle for me to break free was to understand that love bombing, the intensity of love bombing wasn't the same, wasn't real. It wasn't sincerity. And that was the, that was the big thing I was misreading is if a guy came on really strong and, you know, like in hot pursuit, I was just very naive and very gullible and thought that they meant what they said. And I was getting tangled up with a lot of like charming sociopathic people because of that. So I had to learn, I had to learn, you know, love bombing is not love and that there's a difference between sincerity and intensity and that there's, it's important to go slow because everybody can see, anybody can seem really great during the first couple months. And it's just, it just takes time to actually get to know a person. So I had to really approach the way that I did things, the way that I interacted with people very differently. And I also realized that I was making very similar mistakes with friendships. And sometimes it worked fine and sometimes it didn't. And that was why I'm like, I don't understand. I think that's what took me so long to link up that correct cause and effect because before it felt like a hit and run. Like, oh no, that one person is the problem. Like they were totally psycho and obsessive and stalky and, you know, compulsive pathological liars and like just outrageous. They were outrageous. And so it felt like I didn't have the problem because I, I had other people in my life that were fine. It was a hundred percent them that had the problem. And it took me many years to realize, yes, it for sure was a big part of them, but that there were still things within me that needed work. And I was not in tune with my instincts or my intuition about other situations. I, my boundaries needed a lot of work. Um, I didn't realize that charming, that charm was the red flag that it is. So those were the, those were the elements that I struggled with. I think a lot of people, you know, everybody's situation is different, but some people really struggle with staying gone because of um, finances or housing or children or all there's all kinds of reasons and that can even be more diff I mean and exponentially more difficult to leave an abusive partner when those factors are at play it was hard enough for me to leave and I didn't have those things those weren't even issues so <laughs> it's it's a challenge and uh, it can be discouraging. It can be even leaving any relationship that ends, even if it's not abusive, it can still kind of be this discouraging, depressing feeling of not having that person in your life. I mean, it's just any change I think is difficult and hard and has its own set of challenges. Jennifer says, I wanted to be an actress so bad, but my dad, who was the abuser in my life, wanted me to do something to fall back on and wanted me to do graphic design like him. So I went for school. So I went to school for that, but I've been a cashier service desk worker at a store for 15 years now. I feel like I could have enjoyed graphic design, but maybe if he didn't abuse me. Yeah. And that's, 
you know, when we have those realizations of, you know what, I'm not quite sure I'm on the path that I want to be on. And maybe think, I tell you, it's hard to look back at life and kind of wonder like, what if, or what could have been. And I, I, I feel like I would just encourage you to not even open that door to thinking like my life. Cause here's the thing, like there's so many other factors that could have contributed and there was a movie a long time ago. I don't know if you remember it called uh, with Drew Barrymore called riding in cars with boys. And one of the, like, that was such a great movie. And the, her character in the movie gets pregnant young and she had this very promising, she wanted to be a writer. She wanted to move to New York. She wanted to have this, this life and she gets pregnant young and, uh, is kind of stuck in this small town with this life that she doesn't want with this child she didn't want. And she really looks to, she blames all of her, she blames her the way that her life turned out on this child. And it's just kind of like the, the unfolding of it's like this woman's story. It's just, it's a good movie. And it's so easy and understandable, you know, to, to think, man, if this one event had been different, my life would have been totally so much better or so. And the reality is we don't, we don't know, like there probably would have been other things that have come along and our lives at any moment can zigzag. So, um, and it's not too late to change course. If you're like, you know what, I'm just really not feeling it. Like I'm feeling I'm kind of at a dead end and, I, I think some things need to change and, but, you know, like I was saying, change is, is always difficult and uprooting yourself from something that, you know, is, is not easy, but it is possible. So I hope that that came across as um, supportive and not invalidating So Galactic MC, are you putting out are you putting out music on SoundCloud and all of that? Galactic MC says on SoundCloud and band and Bandcamp, Galactic. Okay, so Galactic MC is the name on SoundCloud. You know, something else you might want to try is finding some other people that are in your field or people that you know that like that are connected in some sort of way and just reaching out to them and being like, Hey man, can I like, can I make a song for you? Or can I make an intro for like your YouTube video or um, how can I help you basically like reaching out? Cause so many people on social media get people that are wanting things from them. Like, Hey man, can you shout me out? Hey man, can you do this for me? Hey man, can you like, put me on your channel or can you do this? You know what I'm saying? Like it's, if you can flip that around and approach people and say like, Hey, like I would love to be able to do something for you. And it, like mean it, right? Like honestly mean, Hey man, I really like the work that you're doing on SoundCloud or um, on Instagram or whatever. It'd be really cool. Like, is there any way that I could help, could help you with like your record or Hey, could I, like, here's my Instagram or here's my SoundCloud. I'd really love to feature you guys uh, and just start shouting out other people and promoting other people. And like it, that helps a person. It helps not only helps you, your stuff grow, but it also creates the sense of community and the sense of collaboration. If you can change your mindset to where other people aren't competition, that it's collaboration, that's a game changer. And that can, it, that can be kind of a hard mindset shift to make, especially if you're like, man, I'm finding myself doing all these things for other people. And, 
but this is, and they're not doing anything for me in return. If you kind of give with that expectation and you're like, right now, I'm just going to start sharing with my community music that I think is cool or other things that I think like, and if you just mean it, you know what I mean? Like, this is what I'm about. And this is, uh, then people, people know like, okay, this, you know, then they're interested and then they'll go check people out and then they'll let those people know, yeah, Galactic MC told me to come check out your channel. And, and then, then you can start touch people are like, Oh, like who is Galactic MC and why is this person keep shouting me out? And then they touch base with you. And then it's like this great authentic way to just make that connection of, yeah, dude, like, I don't, I'm not doing this necessarily to like get anything from you. I'm just mentioning your work because I like your work. Like there's no, there's, it'd be cool, you know, if they wanted to collaborate or give you a shout out or whatever, but it's not necessary. It's not required. It's just like, I shout out, I give, I encourage people, other people's channels all the time, like meditation and relaxation. You know, you've probably heard me talk about like Jason Stevenson and Michael Seeley. I'm sure those guys will never hear about me. <laughs> like, is that, I, they're, I think they're in another country and they're, channel is significantly bigger than mine. We don't, our worlds don't really cross. Like they're very much into meditation and relaxation stuff. I don't ever in a million years expect that it would. I'm not even sure how we really could collaborate, even if they, we all wanted to. Um, But you just share cool stuff that you come or like the channel cinema sins that I was talking about earlier. Like if you're just sharing stuff, you're like, yeah, this is really cool. i I love this channel. If you guys are up for something that's totally unrelated, go check it out just because that's how you really feel about their work. And sometimes something might come from that, but you know, sometimes it doesn't, but if you're just saying it cause it, you mean it, then it's, it doesn't matter. Okay, great question. Um, Om, O-M, asks, Dana, what is the best way to tell the difference between intensity and sincerity? I feel like I mistook my ex's intensity for sincerity. After discarding me, he got engaged within a month. The The best way to tell is time. And to see that intensity, when somebody comes on like, you know, they're just off to the races. Like they are just full steam out of the gate kind of a thing. They're persistent. They're text. They're not, I think, paying attention to how somebody responds to you setting boundaries and you making sure that you are having boundaries and that you're treating yourself with value. So there's a bunch of like little ways that we tend to let this stuff kind of slide early on. Because, you know, like, there's that infatuation period and we're like, Oh, they're so, they seem so cute or handsome or, or what have you. And they might be thinking the same thing about us. And it's this whirlwind starts kicking up and we're like, we both want to just jump into it. Right. That's a normal part of any relationship cycle, but it's, it's immature and it's not, it's based on the fantasy that we think this other person is like, we're not seeing them clearly because to see a person clearly, it just takes time and in seeing them in a wide variety of situations. So, um, so here are some ways that people tend to get off track and with a relationship kind of fresh out of the gate, because we want to spend time with them. We want to, we were really like, Hey man, I, they, I will text with them as much as they want to text with me. And the next thing you know, it's hours upon hours, every single day you're seeing them, if they want to see you, you're clearing your schedule. Uh, you know, they're texting you at five in the morning or at midnight when well, normally you'd be asleep. Uh, their text, they want to see you on a Saturday. You clear your whole Saturday. They are inviting you over to their house for dinner, like on the first or second date, or you're doing the same thing. You're having sex early on. These kinds of things are the messages that we're sending to another person is that basically like we're not treating ourselves with value. We're making it a person who 
is respecting their time and their energy and emotions. They have hobbies, they have friends, they have a life and they guard that. They guard that. So they're not going to be so quick to be like, oh, okay, this total stranger that I've gone on two dates with, I'm not, I'm, you know, they're not going to start canceling uh, plans with their children or yoga class, or uh, they're not going to drop everything. And if this person calls you at a three o'clock on a Friday and it's your second date and they said, Hey, can you meet for dinner tonight? A person who really values their time and their energy and emotions is going to be like, you know, like tonight's not good, maybe Monday or maybe Saturday or whatever, like a few days out, like odds are you've got things to do, you know? And even if you don't, I think, it, and this is not about playing games, but it's about paying attention to the tone that your actions are setting. So if a person early on is, and it's not attractive, when a fish is jumping into the boat, nobody wants that fish. So it can seem like, well, but I just feel like I should, if I've got nothing going on that night and they ask me to go out with them and I really want to go out with them, I want to be able to go out with them. You can go out with them. You can do whatever it is that you want to do, but be aware of the tone that you're setting. If you're having a person over to your house for dinner or vice versa, that tends to be code for sex. So be aware of that. Um, a person that really wants wants to to actually date you to court you basically male or female they're going to put in effort so if they're not putting any effort if they're just giving you crumbs if the text messages start to become lewd or they're talking about hey send me nudes or they're just getting crass like that's not somebody that's looking for a relationship um if you're setting boundaries and say hey you know what i i've got plans I, you know, I, I, I go to yoga three times a week or I have a painting class twice a week or whatever, and you don't break your plans. You're like, I make plans around my other plans, right? Uh, and they're not okay with that and they keep pushing you. I really want to see you. When can I see you next? You know, come on, cancel, cancel your plans. And you keep saying, and you, you redraw that line with them and they keep pushing you or they do something total creeper, like show up at your house or they show up at your work, or they keep blowing up your phone when they know that you're that you said, "Hey, I'm gonna be out in a yoga class or out with a friend," or they have some sort of emergency. They've got to see you. That kind of stuff. This is all of the stuff that's early on that we can we can chalk up to not only intensity or sincerity, but as uh, romantic or persistent or ideal. And it's not like, these are the signs of a like, controlling, possessive, problematic people. This is the stuff early on when, when it's somebody just, when it's, when a relationship or dynamic starts to feel off or smothering or concerning, it's generally because there's something off or smothering or concerning about it. Yes. And Grace says, I misunderstood love bombing for them putting in effort. Yeah, I, that's a great way to put that. I did too. You know, I did a video series. Let me see if I can find it real quick and I will link to it in the chat as well. Let's see. I think there's, yeah, there's nine videos. in there. And that series is okay. Good night, healthy love. We'll talk to you here soon. I'm sure. Um, the, okay. The video series that I just put the link to is called red flags of codependency. And even if you don't identify with being codependent, it talks a lot about love bombing, potentially why you got caught up with narcissists, talks about empty, examining your empty buckets. It talks about um, kind of what codependency is, where the term originated from, um, the rushing of intimacy. A lot of people, when they start first start really watching my videos, they're like, you know, they're like, oh no. And now I'm wondering if I a narcissist because I think I might love bomb too. 
And I really like rushing intimacy. Those early flags, that's the like the appeal <laughs> for, for so many of us is if we are starved out emotionally or if we're misinterpreting this kind of stuff, that the love bombing and the rushing of intimacy is something that's sincere, it can feel like you've met your soulmate or your this ideal person in your life. Because they want that like, you just feel this amazing connection, but what's really happening is they're mirroring you heavily, and they're kind of just it's almost like this weird it's manipulative, but it's like ingratiation almost like they really mirror back all of your things about you that are that you like about you, basically, and then they start things start to take a turn so. Um, but that video series, I feel like is really helpful to kind of go through stuff because a lot of codependent people do the love bombing as well, but it's different intention, like narcissists and sociopaths, especially love bomb with the intention of kind of roping, like roping a person into their world in order to be used, abused, or exploited. It's all about like, what can you do for me? Codependent people, I think we tend to love bomb. It's more of like an ingratiation tactic. And sometimes it's sincere where that we're just kind of used to interacting with the world of seeing good in other people. And we like to make other people feel good. At least that's where the old me, that's where the old me, well, still even kind of me today was the old me for sure. It was definitely coming from of really wanting to let other people know everything that was right about them not in order to somehow rope them in or to manipulate them. I think it was because I had gone through life not ever feeling validated. And so I just didn't want other people to not feel validated. But the unintended consequence of that, of of um, kind of like, see, you know, complimenting other people and... Um, forever seeing the good in other people and moving too fast and all of that the unintended consequence was that, you know, it's, it, it draws a lot of the wrong people to you. And then you kind of realize this and then it's, it's really difficult to kind of break free from that. So I meant everything that I said to all of the people that I like quote unquote love bombed. But then I started to, I, then I started to see them clearly is what it was. Versus the people that love bombed me were doing so with the intention of getting like money or sex or, you know, who knows what out of me. James says, Dana, how did you go from making other people feel good like that to not being extra complimentary? You know, it's awareness that it's a problem is always the first step with anything. And so I think the big aha was in realizing, realizing my part in things, realizing that there had been a few problematic people in my life that I, friendship wise, I had moved way too fast with, I had not seen them clearly at all. And so I was just really focused on everything that was really like awesome about them. And so, you know, here I am just laying it unintentionally kind of laying it on thick and really being there for them and just, but basically what it was, it was like poor boundaries and um, like kind of ingratiating behavior and uh, oversharing. Um, so now what I do, if I meet somebody and I'm like, man, I, I see so many things that are right about them because I don't, I also don't want to hurt anybody. And so I don't want to just shower a person with like attention or affection and then realize, boy, this is not the person that I, even if they're not an, an abusive person, like let's say if I'm dating somebody or if I'm f like becoming friends with somebody and I don't want, I don't want to lead anybody on. I don't want to, um, inadvertently hurt somebody and then make them feel like safe and warm and loved and then like pull that away 
Do you see what I'm saying? So I think realizing that that can happen, like that can be the unintended consequence of when we move too quickly and we're kind of overly nice to a person is that it can, it can hurt other people. And I don't want to do that. So I, I, ca I try to catch myself if I'm, I'm paying, I try to pay more attention to the, the vibe or the tone that I'm setting with other people, I guess is what it is. So I still compliment them, but I don't try, there's not this push to kind of um, become fast friends or if they're trying to push me to become fast friends, I don't jump into that whirlwind like I used to and I don't create it like I used to. Okay, good. James says, this is so, so helpful for me right now. Thank you. Yes, you are so welcome. Grace, okay, that's a great question. Grace says, what is the tone that you try to set? Now I'd really try to focus on setting a tone of like a, a peer to peer type relationship, like a relationship, a dynamic of equals of, um, I don't wanna become somebody's like therapist or their mother or a nurse, or um, it, I don't want there to be like this unequal balance. And that was what I continued to find in like, my more so with my friendships with men i didn't necessarily have that issue so much it was more those traits within me were exploited by by men that were more sociopathic and um i guess it was a little i don't know i, I definitely feel like i had more it was more of an unbalanced unequal dynamic with friends so really making sure, keeping things level, being assertive has changed a lot of that and um, not feeling the need to try to jump in and fix them because nobody, most people don't want to be fixed <laughs> like anyhow. So it was, there were so many, there were so many things that I was doing that were just off and not working for me or the other people in my life, but I just, I didn't realize it. So possibly, you know, now instead of trying to feel the need to try to fix other people, it's more of if they ask for starters, because, you know, like nobody also wants a bunch of uh, unsolicited advice in their life. That's just obnoxious. So if they, if they ask, then I'll offer input. Or if I, if they're not asking, I might even say, hey, are you open to some feedback about something? And then depending on what they say, that's, you know, where I go from there. But um, so, you know, seeing if they actually want advice or input, giving resources, uh, giving encouragement, realizing at another big shift is realizing that uh, as a friend, it's more about empowering and, and even running a support group and doing all this stuff. It's more about empowering other people to, to see their own inner strength. Instead of thinking, oh, Dana, Dana is so smart or, you know, she's so nice. Like she can fix stuff, right? I, the, and they probably weren't thinking that anyhow. <laughs> it was probably more like, gosh, Dana really thinks she's a know-it-all or that's just, you, don't, you see what I'm saying? But anyways, I, I didn't, it was more of um, the, realizing that other people, they need to find their own inner strength. Like it's within them. And once they tap into that, then everything just levels up. Like if I tap it, if I'm tapping into that in my own, in my own self and they're tapping into that and that they're realizing that they're competent, that they're capable, it's very self-esteem building and it's very validating. And then the conversations all start to shift because then it's more about lessons learned and aha moments and personal growth instead of this unequal dynamic where I am feeling like, you know, a social worker or a therapist, and they're calling me in the middle of the night thinking that I have the answer when, when really they do. And, and so just, re, just validating people and realize, you know, friendships and, and what have you. And like, you know, I fully believe that you have, you know, like turn, go with your gut, go with your inner wisdom. Like you've got this and we can talk, you know, you can, if you need somebody to talk or you want somebody to listen, like you can call me 
but just kind of shifting that, not feeling that that need to rush in and, and have all the answers. Yeah, <laughs> Bright Blue says, I hate unsolicited advice, particularly from people I don't feel completely safe with. Yeah, unsolicited advice in general is just kind of annoying, right? Like none of us like it. I had a pattern of just of giving it and, you know, then it's just you're frustrating yourself because they're not taking it and then you're just annoying them because they don't want it. And so... Okay, let me scroll up here. Galactic MC is saying, I've been watching a lot of Jordan Peterson lately. You know, I'm not overly familiar with his work, but a lot of the videos of his that I have seen, I've, I have been impressed with. I think he's, one of the things I like about Jordan Peterson, and again, not from overly familiar with his work, but one of the things I like is that he strikes me as a really strong male role model. And I think that, that there's definitely a shortage of that in this world. And so I'm glad he seems like a pretty balanced guy. Um, so that's, that's good. Yeah, James says navigating the world of dating is scary when you look back and have been in manipulationships with several toxic people. Absolutely. And so I think the the big thing with that, one of my favorite exercises is because this took me years to figure out. And I think a lot of people go through this because they just it's hard to connect the dots because all of the because manipulative people, these problematic people can come across in a wide variety of shapes and sizes and dynamics. And so it's hard, it's hard for our brain to link up the correct cause and effect. And so what, what we end up doing more often than not is we start assigning, our brain starts linking up what it thinks is the correct cause and effect. So it might be like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna have all women, I'm avoiding all women. Like they're just trouble. Well, okay, that might work for a person for a certain length of time, but then if you get tangled up with a sociopathic coworker, male coworker, or male neighbor, or male spiritual leader, um, then a person's going to be back to square one with, oh, no, it's that same behavior. But this time it was with a guy who I thought, w or like a coach, or do you know what I mean? Like, I thought this person was safe and that they were good. So, oh, no, now what does this mean to like my worldview and how I, how I interact with how I interact with the world. So, and people, I, I've talked about this before, people will start telling themselves, okay, this one person caused me pain. I'm no longer going to date Scorpios. Take Scorpios off the list. I'm no longer going to date older men or younger women or bartenders or attorneys or uh, Christians or atheists or uh, people that listen to country music or that are vegan or or, 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 and the real, or I'm never going to, and I've even people, some people have even women more so than men, but women have been like, you know what? I'm done with men. I'm just not going to date men. Uh, I'm just going to start dating women. And then, th then they're shocked to find that women can be abusive as well. It's just not on their radar. And same with men, men are like, I'm done with women. And then they're shocked to find that men can be just as abusive, even if they're not in male, male relationships, but like, other significant, like their boss or their coworker or what, or even gay men. I mean, people like it's abusive behavior is the behavior. It's not the gender. It's not the profession. It's not the astrological sign. It's not any of these things. So seeing this stuff clearly for what it is, is, is a huge game changer. Um, but yes. Okay. So seeing it clearly for what it is. So what I would encourage you to do is make a list of all of the different problematic relationships or friendships or dynamics that you've had in your life, even if they might seem to kind of pale in comparison to the relationship that brought you to search out on YouTube, like narcissism or narcissistic abuse. Most people have like that one or two relationships 
where they were like, this is so over the top. This is like lifetime TV movie level crazy. I didn't even realize people lied to this extent. And they have that one or two relationships that bring them, um, that cause them so much pain that they are on the internet. They're trying to figure this stuff out. Once that dust from these relationships starts to settle a little bit, they might realize, you know what? Actually, I've had a few of these friendships like this too. Or you know what? Actually, my dynamic with my mom is a lot like this. So writing down these significant relationships and especially with the relationships you've had later on in life, like with friends or with coworkers that have gone south or with uh, significant others, how did these things start? Because there tends to be a pattern and that pattern tends to point to an unmet need that you have that is being either like intentionally manipulated or somehow tapped into that's causing you to do this over and over and over again, or fall into this over and over and over again. So, you know, I've talked about it in my own life where I had walked around feeling very unloved and very unimportant for a very long time. And because of that, I was, I totally misread love bombing. I, and so I was very quick, anybody that showed me crumbs of kindness or affection or interest, whether it was a friend or a guy, I just ate that up. And I felt like they were my soulmate right away. I just was quick to, to drink all that up and to jump in to, they would more often than not create that whirlwind. And I was very quick to jump into it thinking that that was healthy, that this is what love must feel like. And so once I realized that was the problem, I was able to stop it and slow things way down, way, 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 way down. But that took a lot of practice and it took, it still took a lot of pain of like learning lessons, the hard, I mean, (laughs) all of the lessons that I've shared with you tonight have all come from learning the hard way of like paying attention to the tone that I'm setting. I could not figure out for the longest time. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? How come I'm still attracting these people? What makes them think that it's okay to like perv out or to be inappropriate or to, you know, do these things. And it, it just, it took a while for me to kind of realize the tone that I was unintentionally setting with my actions, because I had been walking around really thinking that, um, uh, very naively thinking that other people, basically other people had the same moral compass that I did and that other people had the same intentions, just general intentions that I did. And if their behavior started to get squirrely or uncomfortable, I glossed over it and gave them the benefit of the doubt more so because I wanted that friendship or that relationship to continue. And I knew deep down that it couldn't continue if they weren't who I thought that they were but I didn't realize that at the time. Like I realized that with the benefit of hindsight, uh, but just seeing people's behavior clearly for what it is and being able to respond to it accordingly. I didn't know how to respond to people's inappropriate behavior accordingly. I would, I would literally freeze and my default reaction, which is definitely a problem. My default reaction would be to smile and nod which is the opposite of like, you know, like asserting yourself and other people, especially like creeper people, you give them an inch, they take a foot. And so here I am, they make some sort of inappropriate request and I'm like, oh, ha, ha. right. And then I walk off. Well, they're misinterpreting. Well, maybe not even misinterpreting. Like they're interpreting as, oh, she's okay with that because she's smiling and laughing. And really I was so uncomfortable. I didn't know what to do. And so I have like this get it goes back to like the whole getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and realizing even if I if that was my default if I would smile and nod that I could always come back later after I'd kind of gathered my wits about me and then address the situation assertively like that's what I do now because I still when things knock me off balance they knock me off balance like I don't know even if I'm practicing having a response to things, it still knocks me off balance and I may or may not respond in the way that I would like to. So if I don't, then I just bring up the issue again. 
Jay asks, I'm a narcissistic person. How to change? Help. Well, you know, like we've been talking about all night, the first step to truly changing anything is awareness that there's a problem. So being narcissistic, narcissism is on a spectrum. And there's a, such a thing that's known as healthy narcissism. And so healthy narcissism is really like a, a good zone for a person to be in. So don't let those words, I'll go through this here in a second. Don't let the, what I'm saying confuse you, okay? Healthy narcissism is not the same as a person being narcissistic. Healthy narcissism is a, is a place in a person where they have the self, they have enough self-esteem that they're like, you know what, I, I, I am worthy of having wants and needs and feelings and goals and dreams. And I can go out there and make things happen. And even if I don't know how to make my dreams happen, I'm determined enough to figure it out. And I can, why not me? Why not now? Kind of just that can do attitude. That's a healthy degree of narcissism. Problematic narcissism is where a person really starts, instead of having like self-esteem, that is really um, not cultivated in a healthy way. And so it's replaced with like self-absorption and um, arrogance and grandiosity and uh, basically all these different substitutes for healthy self-esteem. And it's this attitude of, Instead of why not me, why not now, it's more of a, it's all about me, or it's all about me at the expense of you, or further down the spectrum, it's all about me at the destruction of you. And that past the healthy narcissism, that's a problem. And it's going to impact a person's friendships and their relationships and probably career and on and on and on and on. But if you're seeing stuff if you're seeing, if there's things that I'm talking about or if that you've been reading about with narcissism or you're like, you know what, yikes, that's some of the stuff I do. If you have that level of awareness of, man, yeah, I, there's things about myself I don't like that I feel like that are on that spectrum of being problematically self-absorbed or selfish or what have you. If you're sincerely motivated to work on it, by all means, work on it. So... The problem with a true narcissist is they very rarely have the insight that there's anything wrong with them. It's that these walls of the grandiosity and the arrogance and um, this unhealthy ego that won't let them be wrong. It's that they're, it's, they're selfish, they're entitled, they're, um, in their mind, they're deserving um, of special treatment that they are just superior beings among us mortals. And so they don't ever see that they have any, that there's anything wrong with them. So if you're seeing things about you that you're like, you know what? Yeah, this, I could, this could use some work. I would say more often than not, absolutely. You can change it because you're motivated to change it. It's concerning to you, you know? So now it's just kind of catching, it's interrupting those patterns. So if you're seeing stuff, you're like, man, okay. Uh, you know, I really want to work on that, then, then it's going to be interrupting those patterns and trying to get better at cultivating a healthier way of interacting with others in whatever way you might want to do it. So, but you're not the only one that feels that way. So here's some, another example. So I'm in the middle of recording my first book, making it into an audio book. And um, actually, let me back up because <laughs> I had said this, what was it, last month? that I was working on this, I recorded the whole stinking book and I didn't like it, not the recording. I didn't, I, there were major issues I felt with the book. And so anyways, I recorded the whole book and um, <laughs> didn't like how it turned out. And so I took it back to an editor. I've been reworking on it, reworking it kind of, at, you know, anyways. So now I'm at the process where I'm, re-recording the first book. Anyways, so today I was recording it and the guy 
the sound engineer guy, after I was done, he was like, wow, that your book's really given me a lot to think about. And I was like, oh yeah, how, you know, how's that? And he said, um, he's like, I think there's some things, he's like, it really makes you aware of your own behavior, you know? And so we were kind of talking about that. And I was like, you know, for real, like I started off this journey understanding trying to understand some sociopathic people in my life. I had no idea that I would, it would lead me to this place of like self-discovery and examination of my own behavior there. And it does, it's bound. I think if any person, if you're even remotely introspective, learning about all of this, it's like, it's going to kick up a lot of stuff and it, and it should make a person a, a lot more aware of their behavior in ways that we might have acted insensitively or inappropriately to others. And so when that stuff comes up to realize, okay, if I'm, if, I, if this really disturbs me or if this is concerning, then okay, I can work towards changing it because it bothers me. There's nothing written in stone that says that you can't change any behavior about yourself if you're sincerely motivated to. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's things within me that for sure that I've been made painfully aware of and, you know, you, you work on it and you drive on. So, and I think you'll find too, as you go through this whole process, it's, it's, I think it's just that journey of, um, self-awareness. It, it never for a healthy person, it really never ends. You're always, it's amazing. You're always learning things about yourself. So it's, and it can be difficult to not get overwhelmed by that or to feel, to get stuck in judgment of, man, I can't believe like there's still so many things about me and I wish I did things differently or, you know, what have you, but it's just, it's a lifelong process. And it's really not about trying to judge ourselves. Like that does not help. Like being judgmental and, and, uh, and critical of yourself is not helpful. But if you can replace all that with with um, curiosity and like, okay, why like why was I doing that, or how could I do this differently, or um, how could I handle this situation differently? Like that's when the magic happens. It's not about us doing everything perfectly. And if people are thinking that they are doing things perfectly, like that's its own problem. <laughs> so. <sighs> okay, let's see here. Little Britches says, how to be subtle for normal and healthy when it feels so boring after the whirlwind narcissistic relationship? It feels impossible to learn to think healthy. I think if you can see the whirlwind as the smoke and mirrors that it is, it very quickly loses its appeal. It's sort of like if you've ever come across an online dating scammer, you know, and all of like the love bombing that they do. It's so over the top. It's male or female. Like they are just, they'll just tell you everything that you want to hear and they want to talk to you all the time. And nowadays they're even sending people stuff in the mail. Like they're sending people pictures of their passport and like all kinds of stuff to try to prove that they're real. But anyhow, um, you know, that love, that level of, that level of attention and saying all the right things, it can really sweep a person off their feet if they're mistaking that for sincerity. If you can see it as the online dating scam than it is, you don't even look twice at it because you see, you're like, this is only going to bring pain. Like there is nothing here. This person isn't really this hunky guy stationed overseas or this wealthy entrepreneur hunky wealthy entrepreneur like it's not real like it's not real so once you can see that it's not real then you very quickly can see then if it's not real it's a big fat waste of time so because I value my time I don't want to continue I don't want to lose I, you know like it's not worth it like it's not real so there is this is there's nothing here for me and 
I don't know. And that can take a little bit of doing and it can take practice, like slowing things down. But once the, the appeal of the intensity wears off and you can, and you start, if you're kind of what we're talking about earlier, like if you start putting good in your life, like things that really truly are nourishing you, not shortcuts, the love bombing, it's like fast food. It's, it's junk. You know, it feels good in the moment, but then like you feel gross the rest of the day or the next day, or even the rest of the week. It's not nourishing. It just fills that void or fills that, that need in that moment. And I would imagine it's very similar to, you know, anybody that's struggling with a major addiction like heroin. It's sort of like that, that appeal to such an extreme high be like, how do I have fun? Well, it's like any addiction, right? Like, how do I have fun without cigarettes? How do I have fun without alcohol? How do I have fun without heroin? Like, it's weird to think about that you could actually just have fun without those things. And there's this readjustment period of time of learning how to have healthy fun. And that oftentimes requires like being around different people, being around a different environment, um, getting to know yourself and really thinking about what is actually fun for you. It's the same with, with narcissists and the love bombing and all of that. Like it's not, that's not love. And so when you can see that it loses its appeal. And then the, what does become attractive is stability. And a person who says, who says yes, when they mean yes and no, when they mean no, a person that you can rely on, that you can talk to, that there's that open, honest, sincere solutions oriented communication, that there's this, this relationship or this friendship that actually has substance that if that you can share like your hopes and your dreams and your wants and your needs and your feelings and your fears and all of that stuff with this other person. And they are going, you know, more often than not, they're going to respond in a caring and compassionate and appropriate way. And that this is like a nourishing thing. Once you have a taste of that and yeah, it's not as thrilling as the, you know, the, the passion, the passion, of um, the love bombing and all that. But once you have something that's more substantial, it's so much better than, than the, the smoke and mirrors of the intensity. Cause you realize that intensity is so quickly shifting. Cause it's all about, it's not based on anything other than like the impulsivity of the moment. And, and when that starts, when you see, when you see that, of like, wow, this person, they just throw around words like, I love you. Like marriage means nothing to them. Love means nothing to them. Sex means nothing to them. Promises, like nothing means anything to them. It's all about what they want in the moment. When you see that and you realize how easily that you're going to get hurt by that, because as soon as the shine, the appeal of you wears off, they're going to go on to the next person. Once you see that kind of stuff clearly, it's a lot easier to not be attracted to it. Uh, there's still that pull. There can still be that pull. No lie. But if you can slow things down, and it's us setting the pace that's going to slow things down, that's when the game changer happens. J world says, I react too much, too impulsive, these kinds of things. Okay. So if you're no, if you're having, you're taking this honest inventory of yourself. Okay. And you're like, yes. Oh my goodness. This is me. I jump, I jump before I think things through. And then I find myself in all kinds of really wild situations slow, if you can slow that down, or if you can examine the other situations that you've done that, maybe you've bought a car before you really thought it through, or you um, got married and didn't think it through or started a job or a business or something that you didn't really think it through. Think if you can go back and think about what was that sense of urgency about where you were impulsive 
and maybe kind of setting because not only are you hurting other people, but you're, you can hurt yourself doing that too by acting impulsively. And so thinking, okay, what can I do in the future? Like if this was my pattern in the past, that I was very quick to just make decisions, to be impulsive and to do kind of reckless or even dangerous things. So maybe in the future realizing, okay, I need to take, I need to make it a new rule for myself that I'm going to take 24 hours before I make any major decision or do anything. And you just breathe, giving yourself that space. Meredith says, I love when you say that this is not healthy for me when you realize the certain things you are faced with are not good for you. Yep, can relate. Yes. And that is another big like mindset shift and a big game changer is I think the kind of the first wave of awareness with all of this is, is we start realizing or we start, we, we have the realization that there are people on this planet that are not like us that have no moral compass and they just say words and that they will tell us everything we want to hear. And they don't mean it. Like nothing means anything to them. Like there's no sense of moral, there's no moral compass there. And that's the first level of awareness. And then some people are like, okay, I need to figure out who is a narcissist or a sociopath or an abuser and who isn't. And so they're very focused on keeping abusers out of their life. Understandably so. Totally get that. Then kind of a few, maybe a few waves after that, it starts, people start connecting the dots and then they start realizing, okay, it's not uh, necessarily even about, I mean, keeping abusers out is a really big first step, really big first step. But then it's like, okay, let's tighten up those standards a little bit more getting rid of things and people that are just not, that are toxic for you or that are just not healthy for you or that are just not healthy enough. And then getting up there of like, okay, what is really nourishing me? What is healthy for me? What leaves me feeling like empowered and um, I feel good about myself and I'm feeling good about this environment. And this is just, this seems like I leave here feeling like with these other people in my life, it feels like a win-win situation. Like I think I feel like they're getting a lot out of this, this dynamic, whatever it is. I'm getting a lot out of this dynamic. Our our combined results together is that we're getting a lot out of this dynamic. There's forward momentum here. It feels like we're really whatever we're like the friendship or the relationship or the business dynamic or whatever it is is growing roots. Like there's, there's substance here. It's not based on like what I want or what they want, or it's not, um, it's a win-win type situation and creating more of those like win-wins in your life where this, it's just nourishing. It's just uh, such a game changer. So, Okay. Gray asks, what do you do when your mother is the narcissist? Okay, it's the, it's the same. So a lot of people get hung up on this. They're like, well, okay, it's one thing if you're dating somebody or even if you're married to them, right? like you can divorce them, but like, what about family? And the way I look at it is a toxic person is a toxic person is a toxic person. It doesn't matter if they're you know, a best, if they're a quote unquote best friend or a spouse or a parent or a sibling or whoever, your approach really is going to be the same. And that's going to be, if you're asserting yourself and they're not, they're not listening to you and they continue steamrolling over your boundaries and disrespecting you or abusing you or exploiting you or taking advantage of you it's the same. So you just start distancing yourself and to where you have 
to where you don't have chaos and dis disruption in your life, that you're able to keep a large degree of peace a large amount of the time. So for example, if you have a toxic person who is your mother and odds are if you have a narcissist in your life, they've been setting the pace the whole time. And if you don't give in to them, then they use a lot of guilt and fear and obligation and intimidation to get you to cave in. And so it's going to require that you change a lot of things and that you set, and one of the things that you're having to change is how you set the pace with them. So for example, for Christmas, let's say for Christmas, she wants you, um, she expects you <laughs> to come home for a week and let's say you live out of state. Okay. And so you've been doing this every year for the past 35 years and you have a miserable, everybody has a miserable time, but this is just what you do because this is Christmas and she's your mother. And so now you're like, you know what? This is not working for me. It's expensive to go home. I get nothing out of it. It's not rewarding. It's not enjoyable. We all end up fighting. I end up crying. She's screaming at me. I feel terrible. And then I go home and then I need to go have like six back-to-back -back sessions with my therapist because I feel like I just want to scream at my mother right? Like that, there's something way out of balance if that's how you leave feeling, you know? So the new you might decide, okay, you know what? I can't go stay a week at that house in that den of dysfunction. <laughs> like I can't, I can't go back in there. It's just too much, but maybe I could go there. Like things start to really break down and every family is different, right? So maybe you're like, okay, I can stay there for maybe three days if my brother is there then we can kind of run interference for each other. Maybe you try that and maybe that works or maybe it doesn't work. So then maybe you're like, you know what? Okay, I want to try three days, but I can't stay there. Like it's just too much. So then maybe you decide to stay in a hotel or maybe you go to other and you're like, I can't even do three days. Like I, I think maybe I could go home every other year for Christmas or maybe you decide, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to call. Like, I'm just not going to go down there. Maybe you make up an excuse. A lot of people have a hard time setting boundaries with family. I'm not a big fan of lying, but for some people, until they can start getting comfortable with the truth, they might feel the need that to just to lie at first. And that, I think it's okay. Like, I think you need to do what you need to do in order to get yourself safe and sane. Um. And then over time, as you become more comfortable, like asserting yourself and setting boundaries, like that stuff will iron itself out, but do what you need to do to kind of get peace in your life. So for example, or let's say uh, your mother lives locally and she wants you to have, she wants you to, to take her grocery shopping three times a week and to take her out to lunch every Sunday. And you don't want to do any of that. So maybe you start, and, and I think it's just anticipating if she's not going to handle it well. So like you setting any boundaries with her, she's going to have a meltdown. Well, how am I supposed to eat? How am I supposed to live? You're so selfish. I can't believe you can't make time for me. I made time for you. I used to take you to soccer practice every other week. And when you were a kid, you think I wanted to go to soccer practice? No, I didn't. Yeah, 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 right? You prepare yourself for this. And so when that, so then you kind of figure out, okay, what can you do? So you say, you know what, mom, I, the grocery shopping, I really, one day a week, I think is what we can do. Or you're like, you know what, mom, there's this really new, great service. I found out that Myers delivers, right? Or Safeway delivers. And so I don't need to take you to this. Well, I just, I really want to be there. I really want you to take me four times a week. So I want to pick out all of the produce because I like fresh produce. And so then you have to kind of figure out, okay, what's the, what's going to be, how are you going to redraw that boundary? And so then saying, you know what, mom, I'm just getting busier and I, I can't take you as often. And so then you kind of figure out, maybe you can take her once a week, or maybe it's once every other week, she's going to have a meltdown and you've got to get to that place where you don't cave. And the more peace you start to get in your life, the easier it's going to be to, to start setting boundaries and hold them. Because just, if you can see 
the guilt and the obligation and all of the stuff that she's doing. And you just realize that there's nothing there. Like you don't, there's no sincere relationship there. It's her puppeteering you with guilt and fear and obligation. And, and it's hard, it's a hard pill to swallow to get real with yourself and be like, there is no real, real relationship here. I just am doing these things because I feel obligated because she's my mother, not because I like her or that I love her or even, or that I want to. It's just this relationship of like necessity or obligation. If you can get real with yourself about it, it's a lot easier to kind of get out of that. And if you see the guilt, you're like, you know what? Yeah, she makes me feel guilty, but I don't have to feel guilty. Like she can try to make me feel guilty or try to push me into stuff, but I don't have to give into it. I can still assert myself. And if I'm holding, if I keep giving in because I feel that if I don't, then we, we won't have a relationship, then realize that there's no relationship there to even hold on to. So you might as well start asserting yourself. But yeah, not, not difficult, not, not an easy thing to do. It just takes practice. You know, I don't know if I answered that question earlier. Somebody had asked about kind of the health, finding healthy in your life when you were with, when you had a, an abuser in your life. And so if you're a child uh, or, or even if you're not, even if you're an adult living with a parent or you're still in an abusive relationship, um, you know, really carving out as much peace as you can in your life. Like that's what you can start doing in this moment. Like you don't need to wait to leave in order to start to, to build up a good life for yourself, you know, but like, I, I think I did touch on this earlier, realize that they're not going to like that, or they're not going to be happy for you. But if you can anticipate that and realize that then and not talk to them about everything that's going right in your life, you know, you just realize that they just don't get it. They'll, they'll never get it. And that's, that's, it is what it is. So, um, you know, finding peace, taking that meditation, there's, you know, different, uh, you know, yoga, there's different yoga videos on YouTube. Um, just whatever, whatever peace looks like bringing just more of that into your life. Jay asks, can, I, can um, basically, can the a narcissist or an abuser never change until you leave? Most abusive people don't realize that they have a problem. They blame, it's their mindset. They blame other people for their behavior. And so here's some, here's some things, okay, if this is some of the stuff that you're struggling with is it's okay. It's okay for people to be frustrated and it's okay for people to be angry. It's how we handle that frustration and anger that makes the difference. So you can be frustrated and you can be angry, but that doesn't make it okay to be, to yell or to scream or to call names or to put somebody down or to become intimidating. So the, thinking about, okay, what other ways can I deal with that frustration or that anger? Because an, a, a person that's abusive, their mindset tends to be, they feel like they're t the, the people that they yell at, like their targets, the targets of abuse make them act a certain way because they don't feel over they don't feel in control of their own behavior. So for example, let's say your wife forgets to buy bread at the store. And an, ab and an abusive husband might say something like they might fly into a rage and say, "Oh, you forgot to buy bread at the store." And they might start calling her names or hit her or kick her or shove her or belittle her do really hurtful things because they're frustrated that she forgot to buy bread at the store. It's okay to be frustrated 
that your wife forgot to buy bread at the store, but it's not okay to act like that. So like a healthier response, I mean, cause we all make mistakes, right? Like we all forget to buy stuff at the store sometimes. It just, that happens. So a healthier response would just be, to, you could even say, oh, that really frustrates me. Next time we should make a list, you know, or, oh, well, you forgot to buy bread. I'll stop at the store tomorrow and, and get some. You see what I'm saying? Like you, you, there, you work towards that solution or you just, you just get frustrated. And if it's really frustrating, you leave the room. There's other ways that you can handle that without becoming mean or cruel or hurtful about things. Um, so I think it's aware, being aware of kind of the stuff that you feel that you do need to work on and how that's surfacing in your different relationships. So there's a term out there, it's called fleas. And it comes from if a person grows up or is around abusive or dysfunctional people for any length of time, that they pick up the set of really bad habits and they pick up this kind of dysfunctional way of interacting with the world. So let's say, for example, if you had an abusive parent or parents and that's how they acted. And so you grew up kind of watching this and, and you, maybe you even swore, even as a child, you were like, you know what? I would never act like that. Or I don't ever, or you, you remember the chaos in your home when you were a child and you thought I would never do this to my child. But then now you grow up and you're like, wow, I'm a lot like my dad and that scares me. Or I'm a lot like my mom and that scares me. Or I'm scaring my kids. You know, my kids are crying and I don't want, I don't want my kids to be afraid of me. Like there are these moments where we kind of realize, okay, there's something we need to work. There's some stuff that we need to work on here. If you're having, if you're having this and if you're sincere, you're like, wow, I really want to work on this behavior. Then that's, that kind of stuff falls more in the category of fleas of we picked up some really unhealthy ways of interacting with the world around us. And so we, we can work towards changing that. So if you have a sincere desire to change it, go for it. Um, so yeah, being honest with ourselves is a big start. Oh, I was confused as to what you were saying. Meredith says, Dana, do you say fleece? I was like, did I say fleece? I don't think I said fleece. No, fleas, like, like a dog gets fleas. So like it's the whole, like when you lay down with dogs, you get fleas. So when you're around a lot of dysfunction, you pick up like, like a case of fleas, you pick up fleas, all of these bad behaviors, uh, that kind of become a part of you. And so, uh, and it's like we were talking about earlier, it's so normal for people, myself included, like when we start going through learning about, you know, what's narcissistic, what's codependent, what's problematic, what's healthy, all of this stuff, you're going to see stuff in yourself that's on kind of maybe both ends of that spectrum where you're like, yikes, you know what? There's things about me too that I need to change. I, um, really need to work on how listening to other people or making them feel um, just more validated or, um, you know, making time to spend quality time with friends. That was another big one for me is I, I too had that pattern of like just how I was a therapist to a lot of people. I had this pattern of making men my whole life and not when I was dating them and then not, not keeping up my friendships and then leaning on my friendships when my relationships fell apart and not realizing that that was a problem. And so then now I realize, okay, it's important. I need to really like spend quality time with my friends on a much more regular basis and keep 
my hobbies, keep my friendships, keep that my life outside of my boyfriend going because that's healthy. It's not healthy to just don't, to not have, you know, to not have that much dimension in your life. And so then, and that's the thing, like the, then the kind of the healthier and more in alignment you get, you start seeing that the kind of um, imbalance in other relationships in your life. And so then kind of when I started getting things more equal, I'm like, you know what, I've got a, a lot of other people, a lot of other codependent friends in my life who only call me or want to hang out with me when they're in crisis. They're not there for months or even years at a time. Their relationship blows up and then they call me or, you know, sometimes at three in the morning or whatever, needing somebody. And then as soon as their crisis is resolved, so here I am thinking, oh, it's this friend I haven't heard from in so long. I spend all of this time and energy and really, you know, being there for them and helping them. And then as soon as they get their life fixed, they're often dating again. I never hear from Then they're gone for another year. And then they come back when they're in crisis. And so I have just been like, I don't want that anymore. Like I want a relationship of equals where we can enjoy each other's company, not based on the, the, the crisis in our lives, but based off of like the things that are positive and healthy in our lives. And I, I want relationships across the board that have substance that are not just based on, you know, chaos and in, in the moment kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah, Missouri Cowboy says, people would tell me, oh, she's your mother. You have to love her and do whatever she wants. You. <laughs> Guilt-inducing. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the other things that sets a person free is the realization that other people, unless, unless they've gone through something similar to this, they just don't get it. So many other people walk around thinking, you know, all mothers love their children and they, they're caring and they're nurturing and they would never do anything to hurt their children. There's all kinds of like stereotypes and like beliefs people have about other people and, you know, or that, you know, that your coach always wants the best for you and that's why they push you so hard. Or, and then, the, like, for example, like there was that big, that, that most recent death of that, uh, was it high school? High school or college football player in like Mississippi or Missouri or someplace. I, don't, I forget where. And one of the other coaches had come out and said that he would have, like, the coaching there is awful. And so many parents think that they're, you know, these kids are getting pushed to be their personal best. And He's like, it's just awful here. He's like, I would never let my child play ball at this school. Like, the coaching here is awful. So anyways, the point being is that people tend to think, oh, that, that women, especially mothers, are a certain way. And it's just really difficult for them to compute that they're, not all mothers are like that. Like some mothers are predators and they're just rotten to the core and that that child would probably have a better chance at just being dropped off in the forest and being raised by a wolf. And because other people can't understand that. And so we have to really just detach from trying to get them to understand or get validation from them. And I think with people like that, you know, smile and nod and just not even talk about it. Like there's just no point. There's just no point. Um, and even trying to set them straight is just a waste of time because they just can't even relate. Okay. Well, let me scroll up here. Hmm. Gigi is talking about, oh my goodness, recovering 20 years, 20 year marriage, 
from a person who is quote unquote recovering from a sex addiction and just trying to come to terms with the double life of it all. Yeah, I, with three children, he's abusive and, and an active addiction. Yeah, I think a lot of that, you know, if a person's got this, I think so often time, and we talked about this last time, so often, you know, it's uh, <laughs> sex addiction is just, it's such a great cover for a person who has no moral fiber. And they just go around compulsively cheating. And it's sort of, a, it's a great way to be like, see, it's not my fault. It's the addiction. It's the addiction. It's not that I have no moral fiber. It's, you know what I mean? Like it's so, it's such a way for themselves to make themselves a victim of their own behavior. And it's, and it does such a great job at guilting other people into staying and to fooling them into being like, oh, well, I just, I'm just so sick. And I just, I really want to recover from this, but it's like, no, maybe you just need to keep your pants zipped. Maybe just try that. <laughs> like, have you tried that? I mean, it's just disgusting to me. Um, the way that, that people like that just, there's no character. There's just no character. And with a, with, chronic cheating because let's just let's just get rid of the whole sex addiction term let's just call it what it really is chronic cheating um yeah there's no trust there you know and it, there it would be a mistake to trust that person because they have a pattern of being untrustworthy so yeah i just not a fan of the whole sex addiction thing i think it just re it relieves another a person of responsibility of their behavior and when it comes to character kind of stuff that's sort of like saying i have a stealing addiction you know it's like <laughs> anything can be addiction sugar exercise eating sex sleeping um <laughs> just because i don't know Ugh, just that that sorry that bugs me Oh, goodness. She says, ha, yeah, he's getting baptized at a born again church on Saturday. Oh, the appearances. Yeah. And you know what, Gigi, I guarantee you too, what you know about his behavior is only the tip of the iceberg. That's the kicker with that. And it's amazing the level of deception and deceit that these people can go to. And where you just kind of wonder like, where do you get the energy to be lining all these other people up and to be running around and to be doing all this stuff and, and just the, the, just the lying of it all and then trying to save face. And then now you're a born again Christian and now this and that, and it's just exhausting. So yeah, that kind of stuff. I don't blame you. That's really hard to, to work through that, that behavior sounds very sociopathic to me. That's more than just narcissistic. That sounds really um, exploitative to me. Jay says, my moral compass is very bad. Well, you know, I think, Jay, there comes a time in everybody's life where you have to kind of think about what kind of person do you want to be? How do you want to be remembered? And what kind of life do you want to live? It's 100% within your control. And so just getting real with yourself about the kind of person that you want to be and making your life count. And honestly, a, a life without a moral compass, if a person's just like, okay, they just lie and they cheat and they steal, that stuff catches up with you. And even if you don't think about, <laughs> even if you're not driven by uh, kind of being able to sleep at night and like doing, just doing the right thing because it's the right thing, there's consequences to the wrong thing. You know, you sleep with somebody's wife, you sleep in with the wrong guy's wife, that can 
you know, get you beat up or killed. You're, or, you know, you're stealing from people that can get you thrown in jail or, um, I mean, there's long-term effects that this kind of stuff has. So it's just not worth it. It's a short-term grat your a short-term gratification, and qu the quality the quality of life experiences are long-term gratification. Where we have to delay that instant gratification. Yes, life is a lot easier in the in the immediate short term if your person's just they're have this lying and cheating and stealing and they're just living in the moment and they're having, they're just doing whatever they want to do. It's like Pinocchio living with the, the lost boys or the wild boys in um, Coney Island and the movie Pinocchio, they were just smoking and gambling and eating candy and just doing whatever they want to do. But you can't, you know, you, you can't to stay there like that. There's no quality of life there. It's kind of fun for the time, but, not long term. What were those kids called? Hold on. <laughs> no, I'm good. Pinocchio. And then were they the Lost Boys, the Wild Boys? Did I just make all that up? Pleasure Island, not Coney Island. Coney Island is a real place. They're called the Wild Boys. Okay. Mystery solved. All right. Jennifer says, my dad blamed his abuse on me as a child on sex addiction. So later on in my adult life, when I came out about everything, he said he went to Sex Addicts Anonymous, like that makes it better. My goodness, that's... Yeah, that's, I'm so sorry. Like, that's just disgusting on his end to, to even, to even offer up an excuse for his behavior is disgusting and inappropriate. And to, um, like, it just, it just speaks to the, the lack of insight and awareness of the damage that their behavior does to other people. And yeah. I'm so, I'm just so sorry. That's Marcy is signing off and says, I hope everyone has a good night. Good night. Sleep tight. And Gigi says, yeah, sex addicts and sex offenders have two different motives. Yet one could be both. My husband uses addiction as an excuse as well. Yeah. Yeah. Abusive people in general generally have, because they feel entitled to do what they do. And so they're always looking. There's no sincere accountability of like, I did this and it was inappropriate, like period, end of story. It's always somebody, it's always something else. I was drunk at the time. I, I had a sex addiction. I, you know, you made me do it. This woman threw herself at me. How could I resist? You know, well, you'd gained weight or, you know, you weren't home. Like there's all, just excuse after excuse after excuse. And it's sort of like, you know, my goodness, like enough, just own your behavior and, and then don't do it again. Like it's not difficult. Like, ugh, you know, um, but it's amazing the mental gymnastics narcissists and sociopaths can do in order to avoid accepting sincere accountability for their actions. Like most recently, the, the guy in Colorado uh, who killed his pregnant wife and his two children. And so, you know, if, if, you, if you're watching the story unfold, at first it was like, oh, they've just gone missing. Oh, my goodness. Please, people help us find them. Um, you know, this is so terrible. We, I just don't know where they went. And then a few days later, uh, I think he confessed to it of actually, okay, they're not missing. I'll take you to their bodies. And then he did. And then he said, 
well, actually, I didn't kill my daughters. My, our, my wife, my dead wife killed our daughters. And I got really upset by that. And so then I killed her. And it's just all of, it's like, nobody's buying that dude. Like all of these mental gymnastics to make himself, to distance himself from his own behavior. That's what they do. And it's always an excuse. Jody Arias was the same way. If you guys remember that trial with, uh, she killed a guy named Travis, her kind of on again, off again boyfriend. And everything, Casey Anthony was another one. You know, it was, uh, little girl went missing and then she didn't, you know, didn't know where she was and she was so distraught. And then, you know, um, throwing out every single thing in the book, her father was abusive and, and uh, you know, her parents never really loved her and like this, that, and the other, and, but that she never admitted to, to killing the daughter, but she was offering up all these excuses as to why her parents, she felt like were throwing her under the bus. And, 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 you know, I'm so proud of her parents because her parents, by the end of that trial, they were so disgusted with her. They were like, you're basically, you're dead to us. Like, we don't want anything to do with you. And they walked away, which was, in my opinion, the right thing to do because, you know, toxic, 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 pathological liar just can't, there's nothing there. Jennifer says, I just don't understand if that's NPD behavior or BPD or both. It's all so confusing still. A sexual, a sexual predator that's coming after a child, whether it's their own child or somebody else, and then, you know, using, abusing, exploiting that relationship, the, the exploitation of it all, the grooming behavior of it all, the kind of gaining of trust and then exploiting that trust, all of that, that's definitely on the, the sociopathic side of things. So this kind, and this kind of stuff is not so cut and dry. Like I, I think a lot of people, when they think of like borderline personality disorder stuff, they think of people that are kind of like poor impulse regulation, poor um, um, or em emotional regulation, uh, you know, threatening suicide, threatening self-harm. The, the suicide component is really popular among manipulators in general, narcissists or sociopaths, because they know that it works. They just go around and they just push buttons. Is this going to work to get this person to do what I want? If I tell you that if I have, um, you know, I don't know, like I need, <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be homeless and so I really need you to add me to your bank account. I just need some money. I need to show proof of, of credit. And then next thing you know, they drain your bank account or um, they do something to, let, you know, any, any, you name it, any type of, of abuse um, or exploitative kind of thing. That's what they do. Oh, you don't want to talk to me anymore. I really want to talk to you. Then they call you. I have got cancer. Or I'm suicidal and I, I just, if you don't pick up the phone right now, I swear I'm going to do it. I don't know how much longer I can hang on here. I just need for you to let me know like that you care, that kind of stuff. Sometimes the, the, the threats of suicide, the threats of self-harm, that can be a sign of like borderline personality. But if you're seeing like these um, like extreme, extreme emotional displays but there's like a real like manipulative component to it. And they have this longstanding pattern of like this disregard for like social norms and laws and the, the, the rights of others. And um, they're, they don't seem to have sincere empathy or remorse. Like they might say all the words, just like that guy in Colorado that killed his family says all of the words, but you can tell there's nothing there. There's no depth. He's just saying words. I loved her. I loved them. The house is so empty without them. I hope they're okay. I hope, you know, there's like, and yet, so he's saying things, he's actually, you know, kind of crocodile tears. He's going out supposedly looking for his missing children, saying things and doing some of the things, but things don't add up. If a person, if you feel like they're just giving you lip service, that they're 
I love you, you're my daughter, but then they're like draining funds out of your account. They're abusing you in any way, shape or form. There's this disconnect there between their words and their actions. So yeah, extreme behavior like that is definitely like more in the antisocial range. Okay. Um, okay, let me scroll down here. Okay, sorry, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Yeah, Zachary says emotional manipulators use similar tactics. They could be narcissistic, sociopathic, or borderline, but they all read from the same book. You know, I, I'm so concerned about borderline personality disorder because I think there's a lot of um, that tends to be kind of a catch-all phrase for uh, even a catch-all diagnosis of uh, like emotional dysregulation and it's something that a lot of survivors of abuse are diagnosed with and it may or may not be accurate uh, it's something that a lot of people, especially after trauma, are diagnosed with if they're not diagnosed with PTSD. And more often than not, I really feel that people that have undergone abuse or trauma of any kind, it's it's not so much because personality disorders, it's pervasive and pervasive and persistent. So if, if a person has been like this for like before the abuse, then maybe, maybe there were some borderline features there. But if they weren't like this, and now after the abuse, they're feeling really dysregulated, their emotions are all over the place, they have some days they feel like they want to die. And some days they feel like they're on top of the world. And some days they, you know, are quick to fall for the love bombing. And other days they don't trust people and don't want to leave the house. And there's they're self harming, they're talking about suicide, they're cutting, they're just feeling unhinged, they're feeling like an unhinged, anxious, insecure mess. That, that kind of stuff is more in line with PTSD, like a PTSD response to abuse. If, if they weren't like that before the abuse, then it's more likely PTSD. If they were still like this before the abuse, then yeah, then maybe there's, and that's extreme examples of what I've been talking about, but then it's more borderline. So I'm always concerned when we're talking about borderline that there's going to be people listening to this or that that are here in the chat that have been diagnosed with this and then they're really wondering oh no am i also was i really part of the problem and and even still even if it's not misdiagnosed ptsd even if a person truly does have borderline personality disorder there's such a huge spectrum of it and um there's been i mean i've worked with a new a number of people with borderline personality disorder who were some of my favorite clients, like they, they had, they weren't highly manipulative. Their, their talk of suicide was very real. Their lives were unmanageable. Um, they had, most of them had a, a longstanding history, childhood history of abuse. Um, you know, that I've seen what people, what I feel like people are talking about when they're talking about the, the uh, manipulative, like, yeah, like threatening suicide in order to get their way. I've seen, I've experienced that firsthand with at least one of the sociopaths that I've dated. That kind of stuff is not borderline personality disorder. That's just flat out like sociopathic manipulation. So being like, you know, I guess I'm just going to take all my pills tonight and do this. And it's just, it's not, it's not real. Like true borderlines don't, do stuff like that. Like they're, if they're feeling suicidal, it's not necessarily to get their partner to come back to them. It's more of um, 
they mean it. Like their lives aren't working for them and they don't handle distress well. They don't handle frustration or, or um, hurt, hurt or heartache well. And they're quick to jump to that. So I don't know. That's um, the point being, if you've got an emotional manipulator in your life and they're, they've got this longstanding pattern of the abusive behavior, they've been exploiting you. They have a pathological liar. They're, uh, they can't be trusted. They're just toxic to you. Yeah. By whatever name that you call them, it's not, you know, not worth having in your life. So it's time to start distancing yourself from these people. And especially, you know, Jennifer, like with, 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 if you've got a parent or somebody that um, might be in your inner circle that has a history of being incredibly destructive and dangerous, like, you know, being a child molester that's a big deal. And in my book, that is the deal breaker. And, so, and that's somebody to not ever have around your own children. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they say that they've changed. It doesn't matter if they've gone to therapy. It doesn't matter if their therapist thinks that they've changed. It's that kind of stuff. The risk is just too great to ever expose any anybody. And I, I think if I remember correctly, like you don't have much of a, if any of a relationship with him. And so, but I'm just saying this for other people because other people struggle with this. They're like, oh, but it's, you know, it's your uncle or it's your father or, or it's your mother. And, um, you know, justification, justification. Oh, they were a sex addict. Oh, they didn't know better. Oh, they were molested when they were a child, these kinds of things. And it's just really important that we keep ourselves safe and sane and that we keep those, if we have children, we protect them and keep them safe and sane. They, they, you know, deserve stability in their life and safety. Yeah. Okay. Jennifer says, yeah, I'm no contact with him, but my sister still talks to him and lets me know what's going on. That's right. I remember that now. Yes. And Gigi was saying, yeah, if, if there have to be visits and supervised visits only. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. Yeah, um, Salon is talking to Jennifer and says, it makes sense that you saw your dad as a savior and played down any of his sketchy behavior since he looked after you. You are human, and so it's not your fault. Oh, my goodness. Yes, honey, no, it is not your fault, not by any stretch, not in any way, shape, or form, or any, 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 no. Like, that is not, not your, you were a child, these people are so incredibly predatory that even other adults, healthy, you could have, a, you know, they can charm intelligent, educated adults that are, that are in, poli in the police force, that are mental health professionals, that are, you know, in law and like judges and attorneys, like they do a really good job of schmoozing and charming and trying to convince other people that that they are not predators that they are kind good people as a child you never stood a chance there's nothing you you would not have had the vocabulary or the um emotional intelligence or the abilities the, the dynamic was so unequal a child. I mean, a child versus an adult. Ver, I mean, especially a parent. Now this is, there's <laughs> as children, we can only do so much to keep ourselves safe. I mean, that's why children rely on adults for that. And you did the best you could at that time. And that's the, honestly, that's the best that probably any of us could have done. So it's not like if I was in your shoes that I somehow, you know, could have done different or could have, or could have prevented it or stopped it. Like you, you did probably what any one of us would have ever done. And that's the, that's all any, that's the best any of us can do. Uh, 
Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. Jennifer says I she says I don't have to worry about him being around kids because I don't want kids. And I don't have to worry about his girlfriend having kids around him because she doesn't have kids and her nieces are over 18. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I think, you know, the journey of um, a child who has gone through what you've gone through, it's, it's a process. It's a, it's a process. I have um, um, a friend. I'll have to ask her if she has any books or if she, cause she, I believe went through something very similar. So let me ask around and see if I can kind of get some resources for you if you're interested, because it is, it's a process and um, it's a whole wide mix of emotions. Uh, okay, let's see. Okay, let me, sorry, I'm way behind on the chat here. Gigi's going to bed. Okay, good night. Uh, YHSLP <laughs> says, it's so hard to trust again. Yeah, it is. I think that's, honestly, I think that's one of the biggest reasons that people tend to find themselves in multiple abusive relationships, strangely enough. I think that the common, well, I'll just, answer, we'll just go through this real quick and then we'll do our guided meditation and call it a night because I think we are at the point Yes, we are going to be, we're going to be over. So I, Paul, I'll try to make this quick. I think kind of common thought on um, people that tend to continue to get in abusive relationships is that they're sort of uh, recreating these different relationships in their life in order to have it turn out a different way. And I can kind of see like what they're talking about. I, I don't think that that's all that's going on there. I think there's these vulnerabilities from these early toxic relationships or unhealthy relationships that we have. And because we have these vulnerabilities, like, for example, I think if a person, let's say a person grows up in a, in a home, male or female, they grew up in a home, they have a parent that yells at them, they or is incredibly abusive. Later on in life, they find that they are attracted to uh, abusive people. And maybe, so it could be any number of things. It could be like, that's not registering as a problem because that's how they, that's what they grew up with. It could, it could be that they're shocked to find out that this person is abusive. And then they're like, why do I keep missing all these signs? But it could be that they, like us, are not aware, um, or like so many of us, I should say, are not aware that this person's actually abusive, that abuse mask or the good guy or good gal mask slips down the road and it's really, they're not attracted to them because they're abusive, it's, they're attracted to them because of all the intensity that early on, that, which mistaking that the um, uh, caring or the control for a person being caring, uh, um, mistaking persistence with something that's positive and it's it's not, it's, it's controlling behavior, it's obsession, that kind of thing. Um, um, the other thing is the the trust. And so if a person, if a first person's in an abusive relationship, um, let's, it, it doesn't even matter at what age, but the earlier, the earlier it happens, I think the more primed a person is for abuse later on in life, because all abuse involves some degree of like mind control and manipulation. And there's that grooming behavior. Most abusers will kind of pull their target to them. I'm safe. You can trust me. I'm a friend. I'll never hurt you. 
right? And it's that kind of stuff. And then what do they do? Like you can't trust them. They do end up hurting you. It's it's the exact opposite. And so let's say, for example, if a person goes through that and they're a child and then, then they feel they might be going into therapy dealing with their abuse, but they might not realize, especially as a child, that they have difficulty trusting because because they're now awake to my whole, my original mind map of how adults were, that adults were supposed to protect me and be safe. That's no longer true. And it can feel like gaslighting and it can be unintentional gaslighting if they've got other adults in their life that are trying to tell them, um, oh, no, no, you can trust people. It's just this one person that hurt you. Like, yeah, kind of but there's lots of hurtful people out there. And at a, at a core level, like that child understands that. And so that child, just like as adults, when we go through this kind of stuff as adults, we know that that's why we have trouble trusting. Cause it's like, I have trouble trusting because I don't know how to keep myself safe. And I can't tell who's problematic and who is actually a decent person. That's where a lot of those trust issues stem from. And that's why when I talk about it takes time, like there is no shortcut to that. It's just going to take time. And it's a lot easier to get a false positive about a person than it is to get a false negative. If you're getting a bad vibe from somebody, if you're feeling like they're unsafe, that they're dangerous, that they're destructive or that they're deadly, or you just, you just feel uncomfortable, or if you're experiencing like perpetual confusion or mental anguish those kinds of, if you're feeling in that area, these are signs. Normal people, well-intended people don't come with signs like this. They don't come with feeling this way. It's time to back yourself away from these kinds of people. And, and basically I would just back away completely. There's too many people out there that don't feel that way. You don't need to go back and forth and wonder if you miss, you're missing out on a good person. Like odds are you're not because healthy, normal people with good intentions don't feel that way. Um, So those trust issues tend to resolve when you're able to learn how to discern from a safe person and an unsafe person, and you're you're more prepared to keep yourself safe. So thank you, Sable Miner, for the live stream donation. Because it's that yeah. And up yours, Nark says, yes, Dana, that feeling safe is the priority and it makes it really hard to trust. Absolutely. It takes some time and it's going to take practice. So it's not just time, it's practice. It's practicing paying attention to your instincts and your intuition and interacting with new people and kind of watching that stuff unfold. Their behavior is there is there's like major stuff that's not lining up. Um, words and actions. Um you know, like it, it's the whole picture of it all. Like you're just kind of, you're, you're b- being very observant about all of this. Debbie says, yes, our gut is our first level of protection. Listen to it. It's right. Yes, absolutely. So um, yeah, the, the more you become confident in your ability to to use your discernment and to tell the difference between an unsafe and safe person then this this has its own set of challenges because if you do this right you will never know so that's hard right that's a challenge so if you're like man this this person's really sending off like dangerous vibes and you distance yourself if you've distanced yourself soon enough you won't have that concrete proof that yes in fact they really were dangerous unless you read about them in the paper. So that can feel, it can make us feel hypervigilant. We might even be told by therapists or other people, we're hypervigilant. We only feel this way because we're being abused. Just like the, I'm sure this is like, oh my God, my heart breaks. I think about kids that must be going through this. If they're being abused, then they know deep down, like, I don't know if I trust anybody. And then adults are like, oh, they're just feeling this way because they were abused. And it's like, kind of really, it's more of they're feeling this way because their eyes have been now been opened that they've been sold 
kind of a line of hooey about the world and the way that it works and the people in it, they're seeing things a lot more clearly. So once you wake up to, yeah, it's life is not <laughs> life is not fair. It's not the good guys all wear white and the bad guys all wear black and that you know, the black, the, the bad guys have like twirling a mustache and they're wearing a big black trench coat. Like that's not, it's not so cut and dry. And so an abused child is awake to that. And if they're not kind of guided into, and kids too, as adult, you know, as adults, we're so quick to try to oftentimes get them to do what we want them to do of, regardless of how they feel, you know, oh, you don't like that vegetable, eat it anyhow. Oh, you know, you fall and you scrape your knee. Um, we, you know, what do we, we tell children? Oh, it's okay. You're fine. <laughs> it's like, no, they're not okay. They're not fine. Like their knee hurts. So they're, they're continually being invalidated. So it's a different set of, of challenges that kids have that adults don't have, but it's the same kind of, it's, the same thing needs to happen with them getting into alignment with their, their feelings, especially, and their, um, their instincts about other people and situations. But it's crazy making if you're around a bunch of other people who have never experienced anything like this, and they're still operating with the mind map of, or the worldview of, yes, good guys were white, bad guys were black, and um, they're thinking about things in very cut and dry terms. And they've never experienced like a predatory therapist or a predatory teacher or a predatory woman or like the, all of the different kind of shades of that spectrum that that kind of stuff can come across. So. Uh, New Life says, Dana, I think the audio and video has gone out of sync. Uh, you might want to try refreshing your screen. Maybe that'll help. Okay, so back to getting into alignment with uh, ourselves. Let's do our... Um, guided imagery thing, and then we will call it a night. And I'll see you guys next week. So let's take some time and get comfortable. Whether if you're driving, you might want to pull over for like the next 10 minutes or so. If you are in a place that you can sit comfortably or lay down and get comfortable. Let's take some time and just get centered and comfortable in your body. Let's take some deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. Now bring your attention to the top of your forehead. Relaxing the top of your forehead. Your eyes, your cheeks. Allowing your eyes to soften and grow heavy. Relaxing your jaw and your neck, allowing your tongue to fall from the roof of your mouth and allowing your jaw to fall open. 
Relaxing your shoulders and your arms, feeling them grow heavy as they fall into whatever position is the most comfortable for you. Relaxing your chest, your stomach, and your hips. Allowing your legs to fall into whatever position is the most comfortable for you. Relaxing your legs, your thighs, your calves, your feet, your toes, letting your feet and your legs grow heavy as you relax your body completely. Taking another deep breath in through your nose and exhaling out through your mouth. Now let's take some time to turn inward and focus on your heart beating. Focus on feeling that sensation deep in your chest. And notice that you can feel it as it's radiating out. Perhaps you notice that your arms are pulsing. Or perhaps that your head is pulsing. Or your legs. As that life energy is moving through your body. being fully present in your body. <laughs> and continuing to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Now let's envision a waterfall, a wonderful, wondrous, healing waterfall one of the most spectacular things that you've ever seen. Perhaps that water that's coming off of there is so pure that it looks almost like diamonds. Just this beautiful, shimmering, clear, silverish water. You can feel it beckoning to you. As you walk over to it, imagine yourself walking slowly through it, very slowly, just almost an inch at a time as you're allowing your body to pass through this waterfall. As this water splashes upon you, just rinsing away any negativity, pain, or anxiety that you're ready to release, 
just easily and effortlessly just washes away from your skin and from your very depth of your being, healing every single cell in your body as it slowly and wondrously washes over you. Now taking, let's do seven more deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. Feeling how much lighter and cleaner and refreshed you really are. Acknowledging everything that is good and right about yourself and everything that is good and right about your life. You have come such a long way that you are strong and you are wise, you are courageous, you are intelligent, you are capable. There is so much that is right about you. You're getting more in tune with your instincts and your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions in both big ways and small ways every single day. Think about who you were and what you knew six weeks ago compared to where you are today. Just acknowledge that you have come so far. And I hope that you can also find that you can get excited about how far you're going to come in the next six weeks from now, that you're just on this amazing journey of just rediscovering yourself and reconnecting and living a life that is authentic to you. It's a beautiful thing and it's something that you are deserving of. And it is possible. It is possible. So when you're ready, come on back. You wiggle your fingers or your toes. Come back into your body and open your eyes. Oh, well, thank you. Kuntane, right? <laughs> Kuntane for the live stream donation. And Missouri Cowboy. Yeah, that's no, that's no problem, Missouri Cowboy. It's these live streams, they get a lot of emotions churned up. It's totally understandable. Yeah, that's so true, Seeker. You're so right. It says empathic children are the real warriors. Absolutely. Yes, Meredith says there is so much that is right about you. There is. I, I, I think uh, if there's maybe if there's only one thing that you take away from the whole live stream tonight, maybe it's that that there really is so much that's right about you. So, so don't forget next week, uh, we're going to be doing that vision board project. So I think it'd be fun for us to come up with, think about three words or pictures or something that, that you would want to put on a vision board. If you can find these images, you can save them on your computer on Pinterest or what have you, if you're in the group, either the 365 I Thrive group or in the um, Thrive After Abuse Facebook group or even on the website group, 
uh, I think it'd be fun to kind of share whatever you're comfortable with sharing, but I think let's start creating a compelling vision for ourselves that we can steer into. And yes, next week, <laughs> next week, not tomorrow. So if you guys heard the thumping during the meditation, that was one of the cats. They have learned how to open the cabinets now. They're like little, like little velociraptors. They, they have figured things out and now it's terrifying <laughs> as to what they're going to get into. But yes. Okay. So with all that said, you guys, thank you so much for joining me and for being here and for supporting each other. We'll see you next week. And as always, just lots of love to you guys. You are not alone. You are not crazy and you really can move forward and heal from this. So take care. I'll talk to you guys soon. Good night.